going to call this meeting to order and start with our uh, um, Pledge of Allegiance. Let's uh, start with the roll call. Councilmember Atkin? Here. Councilmember Asher? Here. Councilmember Brinkman? Here. Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember West? Here. School board member Afelt? Here. School board member Simon? He's going to be late. School board member Kent has been excused. School board member Dice? She's, She's excused. And school board member Dwin? Here. All right. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment on items not on the agenda tonight? No? Seeing none? Can I just make a comment about Please. the agenda, which um, is that I, uh, I think I need to leave again at 7.30 tonight, and I just want to be sure that we get through all of the um, important and action items, although they're not action, I guess, but important items that we hope to get through or decide to attend the meeting. Yes, well, um, we have a two-hour uh, meeting, according to our minutes, and Member Atkin and I are going <laughs> to stick to it, right? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Oh, it's good to be reminded that you have a public comment. Please. Actually, It's done. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Anyway, my name is Juliet Dunn. I'm the wellness director for Emory Unified School District. And one of the things I wanted everyone to know um, in light of all that's going on in Washington, D.C., is that we are going to be signing people up for Obamacare. And, uh, and uh, it's called Covered California in California at the Family Resource Center. We've, been, uh, applied, we've applied to become a center to do that. And even if we aren't, we do have social services there on to, at the first Tuesday of every month to talk about Medi-Cal and Medicaid, and we will be working on Obamacare also. So we're reaching out to the communities. We're reaching out to the school as well as the community communities in Emeryville through the rec department to be a center for that kind of information. So I just wanted to let everyone know that we will be there. Um, Ms. Hundley is there from 11 o'clock until 6, Monday through Thursday. Day, and when we can, we will extend those hours if necessary. And we're going forward even though Washington isn't. <laughs> yes. Um, they were in the first day covered California was a business that got 5 million hits on its website. Wow. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we're open for business in California. That's right. How's uh, that start doing? I, uh, okay, I'm on. So, so I talked with uh, the director today, and uh, they're good. They're covered. So we, there's no interruption in service for our Head Start program. Great. Let's move on to the uh, approval of our 915, 9-5, 13-minutes. I have two corrections. Uh, one of them is um, <clears throat> that uh, on... Item number four, staff committee member comments. Uh, I asked for a report from the full service task force, uh, not the city school meeting to be on the agenda, which it is, but that should be reflected in the minutes. And the other one is uh, under the same staff committee member, uh, no, it's under five information items. Um, we, we have, uh, a note that Donahue requested a brief report on the financial history. That is, is that reflected as a public comment? As a question, who would know? It, it was a public comment, uh, as I recollect. It's not doesn't appear to be separately noted as a public comment. I suppose that could be amended. 
Is that your uh, motion? If Lorenz, I'd like yeah. to have public comment. Okay. All right. Would that move approval with a correction? All right. With those and amendments, I, just, I have, have second? one um, question also uh, further down on 5C4 where it says Davis and West requested lifelong medical update to be included as a standing agenda item for future city school committee meetings. I, I wasn't. I just wasn't recalling the lifelong medical update and what exactly that was. I thought maybe it had to do with the Obamacare. Um, is that from lifelong? Is that who presented? No. So I wasn't quite clear on. Um, if if that my correct. memory serves me correct, I remember West, it was Member Davis who. You got to talk louder. Um, it was my, from my understanding that uh, Member Davis had made the request to have the. Um, Obamacare um, come back on a on the agenda as a regular standing item it wasn't lifelong okay it was more about the collaboration with the county regarding the Affordable Health Care Act and maybe that might be through lifelong or or there's some other component some partner that we're working with perhaps and that's why uh, I don't know how lifelong okay. came in okay on the, um, on the minutes so I, I guess just to make sure that that's corrected and then also to ask, my only question is then as a standing agenda item, I'm concerned that every month we're going to be having um, people who are required to come and present for three to five minutes and I, I'm just concerned about our timing in terms of that. I think as a report it would be wonderful, but I'm not sure if there's a person that needs to attend each meeting as a result or if that was your intention. Uh, I think we just want an update. Uh, Please. Uh, actually, the, uh, what I'm thinking of here is just a brief, brief report, and that can certainly be handled by the superintendent. It doesn't mean a staff person has to come to every meeting. Great. I would, uh, I would then um, approve the minutes <coughs> with those uh, distinctions or clarifications. Uh, my question on that was that was that a standing item or a periodic uh, item? I'll, I'll where, where, I think was this your is so integral to yeah. what we're trying to do with ECCL? This whole Mm -hmm. The whole issues around the health arena, both for the students and for the parents and the members of the community, that we would do well to keep it as a standing item. Uh, again, as I say, very brief. Uh, you know, where are we? Is something happening? Nothing happening? Just let's keep our eye on it. That's the intent. Got it. Okay. Just clarifying that. And I would think, you know, something as Miss Dunn just done today. Yeah. With, exactly. With, with advice. Right. Yeah. So is that doable from staff's perspective? Oh yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. We can give. We can give them updates. Great. Thank you very much. All right. So the. Uh, do we have a second? Uh, on, I'll on second the, the of, minutes. Okay. And the, the three items uh, amended uh, are four B to say full service community task force instead mm -hmm. of October city school meeting. Five. Uh, a2 to note that uh, Mr. Donahue's remarks were uh, public comment mm -hmm. and then 5C4 uh, not lifelong medical update but uh, Affordable Health Care Act implementation update as a uh, standing item. Uh, anyone object to the uh, approval of the minutes as amended? Seems that we're all in favor. So adopted. Uh, staff committee member comments. So any staff comments for starters? Everybody come to the art show tomorrow, 6 to 9. <laughs> and don't forget we have the Alameda County Mayor's Conference here next Wednesday night that you're all invited to. Starting at 6 o'clock at Expressions College. The invitation is not to the public, but to the committee members? Uh, the, the public can come for $50 a, a person. Is that right? Yeah. Oh. So, I mean, it's, it's open to anybody. It's just that the fee is $50. And do they have to respond by a certain time, then? Uh, I don't know if there's any. I've never seen any specific time that people have to respond, but we have members from PG&E there. We have other outside agencies, uh, for-profit agencies there. So I would assume if they're there, anybody else can come. And pay at the door. Well, we can't can't pay at the door. Let you have to let the city know because we were only planning on about 50, 55 people. So, okay. RSVP as soon as you possibly can. Any other comments, sure. Superintendent Lindo? Yes. Okay. Um, so, 
that right here. Um, just want to just want to let everyone know that uh, milestone was reached Wednesday night uh, when the board approved the Turner abatement and demolition contract for the uh, begin the process of uh, uh, abatement and demolition for the uh, ESS facility. Um, congratulations, I think, are in order for the board and the city council for paving the way for this demolition to begin uh, in mid-November. So I just want to thank everybody for that work. I mean, for everything that's happened in that regard and. Uh, we're looking forward to that internal work beginning uh, first and then moving on to the remaining pieces, uh, which um, uh, Roy Miller will talk about later on in his presentation. Um, also, um, Oakland Unified School District uh, delivered and installed a kiln in the uh, Sarah Stillman's art class, and we're really appreciative to them, to our Oakland Unified School District partners. Uh, this was a request that was made um, last spring so that they could expand um, their uh, participation with Kala Art uh, Institute, and uh, we're really excited about uh, Kala's support of our students, but also uh, the um, just the the support that Oakland gave us in getting that installed uh, very quickly. Um, just a, a a reminder to all the city um, council members: uh, remember, October 9th, we're having Dave Martinez come to uh, be recognized uh, by the board. Uh, to show our appreciation uh, for his contributions uh, to our our school community, and uh, that will be at the beginning of the board meeting on October 9th. Um, another reminder uh, to the community: October 17th, uh, we will be participating in the Great California Shakeout, and there'll be some um, some other cities that will be participating as well. So, but most schools, um, both in the Oakland, Berkeley, and actually all over California will be participating and you will, you may hear uh, and community members may hear um, uh, simulation sounds uh, coming from the schools on loudspeakers and different things like that. Um, you know, last year when we did the Great American Shakeout, we actually had an earthquake on that day. It was really kind of funny. It was, it came right after the drill. Um, but um, students are going to be practicing uh, drop, duck and cover and uh, then they'll be evacuating the building. So if you see, and that evacuation looks similar to fire drills, so if you see students out and about, um, and if you see more students out and about in the community, uh, you'll sort of know what that's all about. Um, it's all over California. If you have any questions about it, or if any parents out in the audience have any questions about it, please feel free to contact um, your principal at the Emory Secondary School or at Annie Yates. And then yesterday, uh, October 2nd, uh, Governor Brown signed Assembly Bill 484. Uh, this is the uh, legislation implementing the new uh, assessment uh, system in uh, the state of California. It establishes the um, measure of academic performance and progress. Uh, it will be known as MAP. So you've heard STAR in the past and the CST exam that accompanied the STAR test. This is called the MAP. And this will begin, um, they'll begin some statewide assessments, uh, doing some pilots, uh, English language arts and mathematics in 1314. And then um, uh, it will roll out completely in 1415. But this uh, AB 484 actually establishes all the parameters uh, that the State Board of Ed, um, State Superintendent Tom Torlakson, and, um, and the Department of Education uh, will take in transitioning to this new assessment system. And that's all. All right. Any other comments? We uh, are, I, I, yes. I'm sorry. If there's no more staff comments. Um, I just want to let the school community know that on Tuesday, the city council appointed its uh, second poet laureate for the city. And uh, she comes full of ideas. Uh, for youth programs in terms of spoken word. So stay tuned. Your name? What's your name? Uh, Sarah Kabrinsky. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I, I have one other announcement, oh, I guess. Okay. Um, on Wednesday, October 16th, there is a meeting at City Hall about the Sherwin Williams um, development uh, potential, and there's it's followed up by, there's another meeting, I think it's the BPAC, maybe on Monday evening at the um, Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee about that same development project, plus a study session perhaps um, at the next Planning Commission meeting. Okay, so those are all opportunities for the public to weigh in if you're interested or um, want to hear more about the Sherwin-Williams development project.
Uh, do we have uh, a, com a public comment on that comment, Mr. Wong? Um, you, you have to go to the mic if you. I uh, had a senior moment and forgot to say to the public comment that there is a uh, a meeting of the uh, Bay Bridge Park uh, progress status uh, tomorrow in San Francisco. And uh, I will send the details to Cindy regarding time and place. Uh, very important uh, park f uh, and project for all interested parties. That's all. All right. Thank you for that reminder. I'm going to move us on to uh, information item one. We're already uh, a few minutes behind our schedule, but uh, Mr. Powell, you're up first with the Emory Ed Fund. If you can uh, keep your remarks brief, we'd appreciate it. Okay. Um, I'll keep it brief. I'd like to thank our partners at AAA who hosted us recently, the Board of Directors, for our uh, board retreat uh, two weeks ago, and we were able to discuss our goals for next year and continue a strategic discussion around fundraising for the Ed Fund and the school district. Um, recently, appeal letters were sent out to the majority of our volunteers uh, within the Ed Fund and the uh, school district, and we want to first thank our volunteers for their continued service and help and time. Uh, but we also want to let them know that we need uh, funding also for the several programs, which include a, our scholarship program for nearly 20 students in college, our volunteer program, and many grants program, amongst other. Um, every dollar counts, and if you have $10 through $100 a month that can be spared, we do have the availability on our website at emoryed.org, and you can click on the campaign tab to make your donation. And I want to thank um, Ruth Akin for her recent donation through that appeal. Um, thanks to our partners at uh, Pixar Animation Studios who recently submitted their volunteer hours for a match with their foundation and the Ed Fund received a check for $6,200 um, thanks to all of our Pixar reading buddies. Um, we're still recruiting for the senior uh, coach program which was formerly the senior advisor program. Uh, we need about 35 more coaches I want to thank our partners at Wells Fargo who allowed me to make a presentation at their Emeryville Marketing Office Division and Heather Streets who invited me. Um, I'm pleased to report that close to 10 employees are interested in signing up for the program. If you'd like more information, visit www.emeryette.org and click on our Programs tab or you can call 510-601-4997 for more information. Uh, Dr. Lindo and I have been cultivating a relationship with AT&T for over a year, and we have met several times with the Vice President of External Affairs for the Bay Area. And I'm happy to report uh, today that Ms. Clooney, who is the Director of External Affairs of AT&T, will be joining the Emory Ed Fund's Board of Directors uh, next month, and thanks to our new partners at AT&T. Um, AT&T has also notified me of a program called AT&T Chair Simulator Tour. It, is, it was requested if they could host this uh, simulator at our high school, and the chair is made up of a chair, steering wheel, uh, pedals, and a monitor for the driver. Drivers experience a 3D driving simulation involving a city uh, of eight blocks and realistic texts that appear on a smartphone accompanying the chair. This recreates the eyes off the road and hands off the wheel experience of texting while driving and a single experience can range from one to three minutes depending on how well the driver is able to maneuver. And AT&T would like to promote awareness and responsibility around teenagers not texting and driving, and the simulator will show students just how dangerous it can be. The date of the simulation is to be determined, but we are expecting it to be on site next week. And I want to thank again our partners at AT&T. I also want to thank uh, Dave Martinez for uh, $2,900 that has been designated for the Annie Yates Garden and Gardner to support their work there. Lastly, um, the superintendent has successfully uh, secured a meeting with the Gates Foundation, um, and they will be flying down to meet with her regarding a college readiness initiative for a possible grant proposal. 
That's all. Wow. All right. Any questions? Nice comment. Nice activity. Well, Thank you. Yeah, nice work on the AT and T and the and the Gates Foundation. Nice. A year. Took a year. Yeah. Well. Yes. With and still more work to be done there. No, obviously. no, for sure. Yep. For sure. Any public comment on that item? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move on to the uh, COC report. Uh, Mr. Roush, please introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Tom Roush. I'm the uh, chair of the Citizens Oversight Committee for Bond Measure J. And I thought what I'd do today in my time is give you a brief overview of the annual report um, that we completed back in uh, June and have presented to the school board. Um, I will say that we continue to be a strong and dedicated and core group of very dedicated people on the uh, COC. We do meet regularly and uh, we have very good meetings with lots of good questions and issues raised and uh, we feel that we're getting uh, building a great relationship with staff along the way. So the COC is strong, vibrant, and healthy. Uh, the annual report follows the uh, format that we used last year that we thought worked really well. Again, I'll publicly comment on Lisa Carlisle's hard work in pulling this together. We continue to use uh, that template, and I think it's a testament to uh, Lisa's uh, great uh, sense of service uh, to the project that we continue to use it and find it uh, very helpful. A couple of the highlights in the report. Um, on page two, you'll note the COC voted in March 2013 to reduce the number of scheduled meetings to six per year. We have been meeting uh, once a month. Uh, the thought was that we do have uh, enough time, uh, six times a year, to get through our business. And just because of the schedules that we all have and the vacations and the business commitments and so on, uh, we stand at a better chance, we stood a better chance of having the um, a full quorum if we were only meeting six times a year. So it's basically every other month, September, November, January, March, May, and June. Um, so we started that first schedule this September. Our next meeting will be in November. Uh, the chair of the COC does reserve the right to call special meetings during the year with uh, public notica notifications consistent with the Brown Act. Um, I think another item worth highlighting is on page nine, uh, based on the reports we reviewed and the information provided to us, the COC is of the opinion that funds were spent in accordance with me Measure J requirements. So that's probably the one sentence that makes the most sense to include in the report. We then supply um, uh, some analysis of those bond measures, the uh, graphic on page 10, we think uh, goes a long way in explaining some somewhat complicated information in an easy to digest and comprehend format. It also stretched my Excel capabilities to the <laughs> limit. So I'm particularly proud of that and I thought I should share that with you. Um, also another innovation in the report is some of the screen chap captures that we have from the, uh, the flyover prepared by the architects, which we think did a terrific job of helping people understand uh, where the money was being spent, how it was being spent, and sort of being able to visualize the project. Uh, we put a link to the um, animation in its entirety on page 14, so hopefully people will have a chance to take a look at that. Then uh, the other item I wanted to point out is the recommendations. If you look on page, beginning on page 18, uh, we looked back at a finding and the recommendation that we had made in the previous year's report and the action taken and are satisfied that actions were taken in line with our recommendations. We have since also on page 21 through 22 come up with further recommendations based on the prior year and are excited about seeing those uh, followed through. We already have had uh, Roy give us a tremendous um, overview of the approval process used by USD. This is the, uh, the finding on page 22. 
uh, with the recommendation that that be delivered in our September 2013 meeting, uh, which he did do. So I will conclude my comments by wanting to publicly thank uh, Dave Martinez for his service. Dave has resigned from the COC. Um, he's moved out of the area. Uh, Dave was absolutely instrumental in helping get the COC off the ground and uh, form it into the body that it is today. Uh, always great insights, good comments, terrific participation in all of our meetings, and he will be missed for sure. But uh, we know that Dave's going to go on and do wonderful things, and uh, his memory with, with us will, will continue. So, any questions? No question. I just want to acknowledge the tremendous work. This is a volunteer committee. Uh, you guys spend a lot of time and effort and thought on this. And I've been to a number of meetings, and I hear uh, rigorous debate and uh, uh, spirited um, discussion uh, to really try and figure out what's best, ultimately, what's best for communities and making sure that the kid needs of the kids and teachers and families are being served. So. Um, I, I just want to acknowledge that and, and thank you for your tremendous work. Thank you. And I'll, I'll pass that along to the committee. Josh, thanks. Yeah, I would second that. You answered my one question, which was whether you got your briefing at your September meeting on construction expenditure process. We so did. It was very thorough. That's already been carried out. Yeah. Any other member comments or questions? I have a question. For your Excel chart on page 10. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you explain um, the uh, uh, B row a little more thoroughly in terms of what those activities were? It's replace, demolish, or renovate district properties. So, yeah, that's... Um, Well, that's the work associated with replacing or demolishing district properties. I, I don't have the uh, financials in front of me to go through. Line you don't line. have the breakdown of activities that fall under that category? I don't have those with me, no. Not in this report. We have those. We do see those reports, but I don't have that report with me this evening. Could, could someone speak to those activities? Do you have, do you have the report? I don't, I don't have a copy of Oh, yeah, sure. Can I send you So honestly, um, I would have to go back and actually look at what's been logged to 801 versus 802. I, I, can't, I can't at the moment just pull it out of the air either. Um, but uh, I know each time an expenditure is made, um, it's coded to either this, you can see those numbers in brackets ahead, um, so it's coded to either this 801 or 802 category. Would you be if willing to, I, I can, to I can, after the meeting, just to send us an email? That I, sure, or I can I can bring a, a better report back at the next meeting. Whatever you, whatever your pleasure. I just don't. I can't pull it out of my memory at the moment. Yeah, this is a I believe the committee was presented with a much more detailed. Report oh, month by month, absolutely. Based on, so maybe we could just send out the more detailed breakdown. To, Easily, to I mean, so that what the, the COC every month sees a complete breakdown of all of these expenses, and they're categorized based on these uh, resource numbers. So I can do that. I mean, we have the full year's worth of COC reports. Um, I can bring it back. I can email it, whatever, whatever you're... Would our, would our CBO know what those expenditures are? I, I, I think it's, it's a lot. It's I, a lot. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a full year's worth of... Uh, of detail, uh, and, and we can provide it for you. An again. email file would suffice for me. All right. Yeah. Okay. That works great. Yeah. That's easy. Yeah. 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 Mine, it's about six million dollars, so it's good to understand what that is. 
Sure, and they see those reports uh, and review those and approve them every month. I, I will. Uh, to, I'll send out to the full city schools committee. I'll send the the there's. I have in a single PDF all 12 months worth of, of all of the expenditures, and, and you're welcome to those. Thank you. Uh, I just, yeah, I just have one further question. You you highlighted the kind of crux of all of your work, which is that um, I'm trying to remember that you the money was spent in accordance with Measure J, and I'm just trying to find that. I know you said it was on page nine, but I just don't see it on page nine. And oh, the, it, there's been an update, which may have not gotten. Oh, into your I packet. see. Yeah. Maybe that's in our new packet. Right. Then. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I thought I was going blind. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Any public comment on this item? Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you, Mr. Roush, for your work right. and your report. The next item up is uh, from Mr. Bonet, our um, uh, EUSD financial report. And if I could ask you to try to can you do your presentation in about 20 minutes? Five. Five? All right. <laughs> Even better. You can, ask, you can just say any questions. Yeah. Yeah, where this is counts against your time, but So if you don't mind, I'll stand right here so I can push the buttons. Um, this is based on our unaudited actuals that we recently presented uh, at a previous school board meeting in September. And the first slide is a, just a graphical showing of our revenues. Uh, the big blue section is from revenue limit. And just to tell you, in fiscal year 13-14, the whole financing for schools has changed. So the revenue limit does not exist for schools anymore. It, we've gone to what is called the local control funding formula uh, imposed by the state. So, but for last year, uh, this reflects the revenue limit, which is our general purpose uh, unrestricted funds that we use for most all operations of the school district. Then we have a small slice of federal revenues, other state revenues, and our other local revenues of about $3.7 million, which most of that comes from the local community via the parcel tax. And then a small sliver of uh, transfers in. This is a graphical depiction of our expenditures. So the, the big blue section again is certificated salaries and those are basically our teachers and our administrators. So that's all the employees that have to have a certificate to do the jobs that they're doing for the district. And then we have classified salaries and then employee benefits that service both the certificated and the classified salaries. That includes uh, CalSTRS for teacher retirement, CalPERS, classified retirement, workers' compensation, unemployment, Social Security, Medi-Cal, Medicare, and health and welfare benefits. Uh, books and supplies, and then services, other operating expenses, basically PG&E contracted services, and then a small sliver of transfers out. 
What are the transfer in and transfer out? That's not inter-district transfers. They are inter-fund transfers. Yeah. So we transfer dollars to our cafeteria fund, mm -hmm. and we transfer dollars, a small amount, to help support our child development fund. Yeah. So uh, an inter-district transfer student would just come under the regular ADA that would be... Through the revenue, revenue limit. limit, yes. So in the past, we've made contributions from our unrestricted side of the house to our restricted. And those are basically our categorical programs, things that we receive money for uh, prescribed programs. And uh, so this last year, we reduced those contributions to the, some of those prescribed programs um, from 902000 in 1112 to 557,000 in 1213. Um, so that was a pretty significant savings for our general fund uh, unrestricted portion. Uh, so some of the transfers out that we have to other funds, I mentioned child development fund and our child nutrition program. In the past, the contribution from the general fund to child nutrition was in excess of $300,000. So we changed the program. Uh, we have a company providing meals uh, instead of cooking them in our kitchens. And so we re greatly reduce our costs in that area. Do you want questions as you go? Or at sure. the end, I'll, take, or I'll ask questions. It doesn't matter. Sure, so you don't okay. lose your question. Um, great, thank you. Tell me what the child development, I realize it's a very small amount, but I'm not understanding what that fund represents. That fund represents the... Uh, contract that we have with the YMCA. Uh, the dollars flow through the district. We contract with YMCA to provide that service. These are federal Head Start dollars. But certainly it's more than $199 that flows through the district. That's correct. That program operates about 145 to 154 depending on their uh, enrollment. Depending on the number of 150,000? 150,000. Okay. 154,000 to 145,000, depending on the students that they serve. And, and then in terms of child nutrition, you're saying you, <clears throat> you contracted the um, meals, which means that you reduced the staff costs? We reduced staff costs. That's correct. But that's not the total cost of the program, it's just the interfund transfer, it's a certain amount that that's that's, covered. That, that's the amount that was coming from the general fund and going into our food service program fund or child nutrition fund, and that's fund 130. And, and the rest of the program would be funded by federal national school lunch dollars? Federal and state. And, state. and also local sales. So what you're saying is that the federal money doesn't cover the actual costs of providing the food that you're providing to the students? It doesn't cover the entire cost of the program. Okay. So Mr. Bonnet, the $199 for child development, are you saying that's the amount uh, transferred from the general fund to the child development program? That's correct. Okay. So, so in other words, even the contract for child development didn't pay for the child development program, the state contract? That's right. We're this last year, we held them to that, or, uh, well, with yeah. the exception of $199. If they're only $200 off, I'll make up the right. yeah. That's fine. So uh, this page is our multi-year projections. Uh, we had our 1213 estimated actuals, and actually there are unaudited actuals now. Uh, and our ending fund balance, total is $5,091,099. Uh, that top line is our revenues of 11 million, expenses of nine, and uh, excess of revenues over expenses of $2.1 million. Uh, and then as you go across in that middle yellow line, uh, you'll see what the projected uh, I'll, I'll call it income for lack of a better term right now, 
of 61,000, and then we start some deficit spending of 313,000 and 239. Now, I need to tell you these are very conservative numbers, and uh, after P, after our first interim report, those numbers in all likelihood will go down considerably, and by the second interim, they'll go, they may go down a little more. And I say that because in building the budget for 13-14, we're very conservative with our estimates of income, and we were, uh, excuse me, with the revised budget for 13-14, we're still unclear with some of the technical aspects of the new funding formula. So those still are changing at the state level. So some of those rules are changing currently, and uh, we hope it gets a little better as we go down and the legislature makes its mind up on technical aspects of things like necessary small schools, uh, the impact uh, particular to Emeryville is that we became basic aid for one year in 12-13 and how LCFF impacts that uh, for districts like ours in the current budget year. Can you explain that a little bit more for people who don't understand what basic aid is and a refresher? Uh, basic aid in, under the revenue limit formula is where districts receive tax money, local tax money, in excess of the state revenue limit thus uh, allowing the state not to pay districts, quote, a basic aid amount. In the past, that amount was about $120 per ADA, uh, but with the deficits that we've had, the state hasn't been funding that amount. The the the, that's correct. The, the deficit the state, state has deficits, had. deficits, not school district deficits. So in that revenue limit formula over the last few years, that deficit factor has been about 22% for school districts. So we were operating with 22% less dollars the last, this last year in 11-12 and 12-13. And but part of the reason why the basic aid uh, we became basic aid had to do with the, the uh, dissolution of redevelopment. That's correct. So, so the speak to that a little bit. Yeah. The county controller's office was holding redevelopment agency funds uh, because the city was contesting, or the RDA was contesting, uh, a technical aspect of a tax increment as it applied to RDAs. Statewide, this impacted. Uh, all districts statewide that had RDAs. Los Angeles Unified was greatly affected and they had a lawsuit with regard to this uh, with the state of California, which was recently resolved, which stated that those monies revert back to school districts. <laughs> so we kind of hit a bonanza in 12-13 uh, with regard to those RDA monies, which made us basic aid for one year. It's a one-time bonanza. It's a one-time. Yeah. It's a one-time impact on uh, the school district's funds. Is that why the 11.3 is significantly more than, for example, the 13-14 9.9 budget? That's correct. And yes. that was enough to put you into basic aid. That was enough wow. to put us into basic aid. And and now he's saying the status is of basic aid under LCFF. Uh, may may um, what reduce our somewhat because they're assuming we're always going to be basic aid when we're not. We were just right. so right. So we need the state to figure out how they're treating um, districts like us who skipped into basic aid for one year, but really are revenue limit districts. So other districts that were basic aid for quite some time. Uh, weren't imposed a 22 percent deficit factor on their revenue limit dollars. So states t 
took dollars away from the state categorical funds that, that those districts received. And that impacts us because that happened to us in 1213 for one year only. So that's an issue that's one of those technical issues that's being resolved at the state level with regard to districts that were basic aid for one year. So there are other districts, uh, others besides EUSD, I'm sure, that had redevelopment money that was an influx for one year that this happened to? Do you, do you kind of check in with those other districts in terms of the state's response, or is this a kind of you're on your own? Kind of you're on your own. Uh. Um, however, there's enough of us talking at the state level that people are listening. Um, Joel Montero, who's the chief operating off officer for FICMAT, which is a statewide uh, financial management crisis intervention team, something like that, uh, is aware of it and has been discussing this in Sacramento uh, with the Department of Finance. I just have a quick question. What, what assumptions were used on the parcel tax as far as projection looking forward? Uh, basically just straight line, or straight line okay. for what we received this last year uh, moving forward. So for the next two years of a straight line? Yes. I have another question. Is this an issue that we should have of uh, the school district lobbyists up in Sacramento informed of and actively working on? Because we cannot leave it to the good offices of the state <laughs> government. Uh, if if the lo our lobbyists aren't aware of it and aren't working on it, uh, I would hope the school district would direct them to have a heads I, up I on it. I think that's a, a good idea as soon as we um, this is just emerging in the last 30 right. days or so, so I think we want to get our, our facts straight before we arm our uh, lobbyists. But don't leave it to the state to help you out. We're, we're, we're not just Please. leaving. We also happen to have a, a school board member who is very active in some <laughs> of these activities at the state level. So I think we're, use some we're one of the yeah. luckiest state school boards in the state, but I, I think your point's very well Good. taken. As soon as we have the right information, if it looks like we're running into a roadblock, um, then, then we may also have to employ that Good. And, and, approach. And, and we have been in, in contact with towns and public affairs and they're watching it. Good. So. So before you change to the next slide, if, you, if I may, I'm concerned about um, the projected 14, 15, and 15, 16 negative uh, revenues minus expenditures numbers. And I just, you know, I feel like I need to get an answer if, if that doesn't look sustainable to me if those numbers, and I know you said you'd, they would be revised likely, but it just doesn't look like a balanced budget. Well, they will, it isn't right now. Right. But I'll tell you, my 13, 14 numbers are wrong. And I say that because the LCFF numbers, those numbers are gonna be changing until the state makes up, it, until they take care of all the technical problems with that. Uh, I've, use, there's three spreadsheets that are out in, at least that I've used for the LCFF calculation, and they're all three different numbers. So I use the most conservative one. So as we work through this, that's why I'm saying those numbers will go down as I get to the first interim reporting and the second interim. And, the, and let me say there's also member, um, Wes, the, the school district has typically always uh, deficit budgeted, but there's been very few years of that I can remember since being involved with the district that we've ever actually deficit spend for actuals. So as um, Mr. Barnett said, you know, this is just a budget that he's put together based on some um, projections and assumptions. But like I said, in years, we've never um, deficit spend. And the funding for the LCFF ramps up as it goes further out into the next, I think, seven or eight years. Um, so the, the increases are smaller in the beginning as opposed over the next uh, three to five years. And the numbers in 15, 16 are more shaky. The further you go out and do projections, the more wrong they are. 
So, but, uh, the be but they are our best guess at the time I put this together. Plus, going back to the parcel tax, that was flat for those years going forward. That's correct. So we know we have more dollars coming in on the parcel tax, which is not reflected That's in correct. that number. So I, I have to say, I, from the school board standpoint, we feel very, very lucky to have Mr. Benet as our um, CFO and to be particularly in this time of change where the rules are changing uh, and our approach is always to project conservatively so that we're very aware of what we have to negotiate with the state. Uh, it keeps the fire under us because we do not want to make cuts. Um, and so we, this gives us the reality to work with on the worst case, and then we negotiate to the best case. And I, I can say we've had no better negotiator than Mr. Benet uh, representing us with the state. Yeah, there's, a, there's another uh, point to this that is, is really important. Uh, the Department of Finance puts out its numbers, and they already build in a conservative projection. Uh, school Services has uh, shared that with us. We went to a workshop last week on the budget, school budgets. And then uh, from that, after the Department of Finance does that, then um, we then create our budgets, and we also work with School Services, who gives, uh, they have a calculator and then their calculator is conservative. And so there's three levels of conservative projections that are essentially put into that. Um, and, but and from a small school's perspective, small school district perspective, we have a program, K-12 program, that we are striving to maintain. And so in our assumptions, as we, as we put our, our projections, our multi-year projections together, which we have to do for the county, um, we have to show and demonstrate that we can um, essentially sustain a K-12 uh, school system. And, uh, you know, as uh, Trustee DeWin uh, said, you know, we are deficit budgeting, not deficit spending. And uh, you can see from our healthy and the fund balance that we are. And he'll, he has a couple more slides uh, to share with you as well uh, regarding that. So I think one other very quick point to point out is the only reason we can afford to deficit budget is because of our uh, reserves. We do not and want to repeat history again. So because we have healthy reserves, we can take a little bit of a risk and not lay off staff. Um, um, but, you know, we have had to lay off staff in the past. It's not something we want to do. But um, given our healthy reserves, we're able to take some, some risk with the future. Um, are those reserves the 4% reserves that were mentioned in the presentation? I, I have a slide that okay. breaks out the reserves. Okay, can I ask you two more questions then before sure. we leave this, which is, do you have this broken out in terms of per pupil uh, spending? That's how the money is calculated by the state, even in LCFF, which I'm not as familiar with. Uh, I can do that. Yeah. It's not reflected in these slides. Okay. Because my, um, when the revenues are projected to go down from this year to next, my question is, is that to reflect enrollment uh, decline or... Um, no, that's the that's the change from the one-time uh, basic aid amount to the LCFF funding formula. Okay. So the the one-time spike in income was strictly from the RDA uh, Los Angeles Unified um, settlement with the RDA. Settlement. It wasn't just. Well, it was a. It was. They, they won the case. Redevelopment agencies around the state were putting money into a account for years, years and years. And that money was building up, and then when they won the case, that money was distributed on a one-time basis. So it, it's it, it's many many years of funds all coming in at once. Unfortunately, it's it's caused other problems, and we're and we're dealing with that. So that was not money from the Emeryville RDA, but it was a state fund, you're state saying, that was distributed? Well, it's Emeryville's portion, portion of the state, but it's many, many years of funds. It wasn't just the kickback from the due diligence review that we went through and other... No. no. Okay. I'd like a little more history on that, because I'm not as familiar with that. Um, I don't know if the rest of the council already knows about that fund, but it's something I wasn't familiar with. I'll have to revisit that okay. with the county controller, uh, Carol Orth to get the background. And then um, my final question is, um, Member Brinkman asked about the parcel tax and the
projections going forward, and you mentioned in two years, and I know this only goes through the next two years, but um, I'd just like to understand better what the future, the long-term future of the parcel tax is or, or um, what the plan is around that. Well, right now I'm budgeting on a straight line, mm -hmm. but there are projects that just aren't complete yet that will hit those tax rolls. And uh, we, we contract with NBS, was a consultant with regard to parcel tax. I'll see if they can't get that information for me for I, by I at least by second, second reporting period, interim reporting period, which will also reduce the um, deficit spending in the out years. But my other question is, what does the parcel tax need to be renewed and at what level and what are the plans around that? Because I don't think it's in perpetuity. The school board hasn't made that decision yet, so we're in the process of gathering information. Do you know how long this par current parcel tax is good for? 2017. Okay. But because we are required um, by the county and state to uh, deliver multi-year projections to demonstrate that we can run a school district for three years, uh, we're required to actually uh, begin our parcel tax work earlier than it might normally, one might normally think, um, because otherwise, in that in that out year of 1617, uh, if we were to show that if we were to go out for the parcel in 1617, it would be too late uh, to present that and uh, to present that to the county, and then we could be, it would it would appear as though we were back in, you know, an unhealthy situation. Because without the parcel tax, I'm just going back to the very first page, which has the revenues. Um, you said it, it's the main portion of the 3.7 other local revenue compared with, sorry, it's a little hard to read the numbers. Yep. yep. Six. So it's, it's more than half of the state funds that we're receiving. It, it, it's equal to a third of the total. Our parcel tax is about $2.4 million. Okay. That's right. A little more than that. So this would look very different if the parcel tax was taken out of the revenue. It's huge. Oh, absolutely. And we don't have to do that until 2017. Thank you. Mr. Bonet, um, what is, what is in 14-15, what's the LCFF state aid projection based on? Is it just a I flat? don't have it off the top of my head. No, but I, did you increase it or? Yes, it does get increased. Uh, I don't know by how much. I. I don't have it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Yeah, the the, the this year over 12, 13. Well, the LCFF is an eight-year phase-in to get to a, a target level of funding, and this year the state as a whole took a 11.7 uh, percent step toward that target, and next year, based on where we're at currently with revenues. Uh, the, the state board told our implementation working group that the estimate is 16.4 percent. So it's, an, it's a bigger step than uh, the current estimates are than we took this year, which probably is not what the I don't assuming is a higher level than the conservative numbers you're I being believe it is, given yes. from school services or elsewhere. Right, I, I think as it's been said these are this is a snapshot the purpose of this agenda item as I understand it is to, to give the you know, both parties a chance to see this snapshot um, but um, as we've learned in California funding for schools is um, a moving target and um, and so luckily we have an excellent um, um, uh, marksman for that moving target uh, to negotiate the changes I think what we have to really understand, with this is the biggest change in 40 years right. that school financing will be partaking in. There's a lot of <clears throat> uncertainties right now regarding how it will be funded in the future. So at this point in time, all districts uh, within the state have to be very conservative about their projections because, to be honest, you know, no one knows right now what the future looks like. So. I mean, his 14, 15 is a very, very conservative number. And hopefully that will increase. But at this point in time, because of the uncertainties of how the how schools will be funded in the future, 
it really is best at this time to be at its most conservative as you can. And I think it's also really important for you to know that, uh, you know, public education in the state's not going away and that uh, Governor Brown, uh, to his credit, has actually uh, opened the conversation about funding, uh, funding for public education in the state. And, and I think that we're probably in for a much more positive picture. I mean, this is, the, this is a very, very positive step um, that we have. Uh, just him even able, being able to um, get the LCFF passed and begin this conversation. Um, we are 49th in the nation, and we should not be. Exactly. We should be in the top 10. And uh, this begins the conversation. So I don't want this to end on a bleak note of, un you know, of uncertainty. Uh, I think it's um, a very, very positive step. It's just that because, you know, of this transition, with this transition, uh, we have to present to you as, as conservative as we can in order to ensure the fiscal health of this school district. All right. Um. We're past our time for this item, uh -oh. but that's, uh, that's okay. I, I just say that uh, I'll speed it up. On focus. Okay. Uh, so our multi-year projections, some of the assumptions we've included, step and column increases are in place for our uh, salaries and benefits. Uh, we've used a 5% increase for utilities year over year. Um, we have taken out uh, some federal income and expenses out of 1415 and 1516 that total about $212,000 uh, because we have a grant that's going away. Um, again, the projections are conservative and the expectation is that by the second interim, which is about February 20th, that the deficit amounts will be reduced in the out years. So our ending fund balance, some of the breakdown for that uh, for 12-13, our revolving cash is $10,000. Our designated for economic uncertainties, which is our 4% requirement by the state, is met uh, out to 15-16. We have 454000 that we're going to be using for uh, technology replacement. We're doing that currently. So that amount will drop also by... Um, second interim. So that's part of some planned deficit spending in fiscal year 13-14. It, it also is related to the Smarter Balance Assessment, which is the new assessment system, which is an online test taking system that we have to get up to speed for as well. So we're taking all of that into account. Uh, we have a reserve for facilities of $2.9 million. We have our general fund unappropriated amount at 1.1, and we have restricted uh, ending balance of uh, 141,000. That's basically some set categorical uh, items that either were deferred or uh, haven't been budgeted yet. I have a question. So, um, what are the what are the projections that have the reserve facilities line item increasing over? So we took some of that one-time dollars from the RDA and put that in that. Uh, I understand for 12-13, but how is it increasing in 13-14, 14-15? It increases because there's a we receive income from community redevelopment, specifically for facilities that weren't associated with the revenue limit. Those dollars uh, are straight-lined. But that's why that increases. So those dollars will be coming in in 13, 14, and 14, 15? That's correct. When do they end? Do you know? Uh, I do not. I'm trying to schedule a, a meeting with um, county controller's office to get more information on that. So our ending fund balance uh, ranges from $5 million and then out to 14, 15 to 4.5. with still maintaining our 4% state requirement and a healthy, unrestricted uh, fund balance. Uh, these are the fund balances for all of our other funds uh, besides the general fund.
cafeteria is small because we do make a contribution, but we do keep some cash in there. Uh, we have a small deferred maintenance fund. Uh, we have a special reserve for retiree benefits, uh, 35000 The building fund, where all of our bond proceeds are, is $56 million. We have a capital facility capital facilities fund, 3.3, uh, which is basically developer fees, uh, and then our bond interest and redemption fund, which is uh, controlled by the county controller's office. We don't uh, touch that fund at all. Mr. Renee, the capital facilities fund is some of that part of the reserve for our facilities that we'd be looking at as reserves for uh, the new facility? No. The capital facilities fund, um, some of that is from MOU, I'm looking for Roy, uh, <laughs> MOU 1 so, and, two. and 2 and developer fees. Majority, I believe, are developer fees. Can I ask, um, the capital facilities money, what is the plan to use that? Uh, for uh, ECCL project. So it'll be folded into the, uh, the bond money above? Yes. So the overall fiscal health of the district uh, is very, uh, looks very good for the next three years uh, with the idea that the state will be increasing funding for schools for the next eight years. Um, we do maintain our operations and maintenance budget and we assume that budget will be reduced when we open the new school um, and as of today in that facility reserve account uh, we have just about six years of uh, capital reserve funds to meet the MOU 3 requirement at, at this time that's it sorry it took so long no, I just have a couple of questions couple of questions. Um, the first, can you talk briefly about what you factored in for the developer fees? Was that straight line too? Because that's... Actually that went down considerably that went down. because it does go up and down um, okay. and I believe I bumped it down to one of its lowest years. Okay, but we will have more developer fees coming in so that should help improve some of those numbers. Yes. And the other thing is I want to thank all the taxpayers because if you would have seen the financials 10 years ago compared to today, I mean, it's astounding. We had nothing in any other categories 10 years ago. And have reserves, it's, I never thought I'd ever see the day that we would actually have four or five million dollars in reserves. So I mean, but it's, you know, the foundation was set by the taxpayers approving the parcel tax twice. So thank you, taxpayers. Well, the taxpayer dollars really aren't factored in the reserves except for the dollars that we're gonna use for the replacement of te technology. So parcel tax really isn't a big portion except for that uh, replacement of technology account. We're using parcel tax for that and putting those dollars back in the classroom. And just one last comment. Deficit budgeting or deficit spending doesn't lead districts to bankruptcy. What leads districts to bankruptcy is a lack of cash. And with the reserves that we have, we have plenty of cash uh, to operate our district. Okay. All right. Any uh, public comment on the ESU, EUSD financials? Great report. Thank you, Mr. Bonet. Uh, it's always great when we have millions in the bank. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the purpose That's of this. Right. And, and again, I have to remind so. people that bottom line is because of this bizarre redevelopment change. We've got these one-time windfalls, <clears throat> so I, I think it's dangerous to assume that the salaries are based on year-to-year -year income. If you hire people based on one-time income, it's a good way to get in the kind of trouble this Absolutely. district has gotten Absolutely. into before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But because of these, because of that cushion, as the state goes up and down in its funding, 
it means we can assure our teachers stable employment because we have the cushion that when it dips down, we don't have to lay a bunch of people off. And so I think that's, that's the real value of the policy that the district has held of maintaining enough reserves for the volatility in state funding. I think we should move on to the next item. And we'll yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have one other question that we'll not answer tonight, but I'm just going to raise it so that okay. we have it in, uh, in mind, which is just around a, a um, how we compensate our teachers and how our teachers' salaries compare with other districts nearby or similarly sized districts. There aren't very many as small as ours, I know. Um, and what, what that looks like um, and how that's projected because we know that uh, retaining the best teachers is the most important part of any educational program, more important even than the buildings and facilities that we build. So I would love to hear more about that at some point. I'll just briefly, <laughs> yes. briefly speak to that because we recently took a look at that coming out of negotiations. And our teachers are, I believe, in the top three total comp in the county uh, with regard to salary and health and welfare benefits. Uh, we're putting a fact sheet together um, and we'll be distributing that to the board and the board can share that at the next city schools meeting. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next item is the third party agreements. The library, are you taking this, Mr. Miller? I'm, I'm going to start. Okay. We've got uh, on the agenda 45 minutes for it, but, but that went over about 20 minutes. So, do you have I think a? We should take however much we need. Okay. Well, is that, no, well I guess I, well, I guess my question is to the right. Do we do we want to? You have to take a vote. Yeah, because in every committee and public meeting that I ever have, we go until we're done. So we have our our bylaws, as Member West pointed out to us last time, limits this city schools meeting to two hours. Well, so if okay. we if we want to extend it, we can do it by motion, or we, we can amend the agenda. Well, can we wait till we get to about 725 and, and let's see where we're at? Yeah, and just if, roll it. Come on. Right. We feel, then we can expand. Why should we look at this one? Okay. So everybody has been forewarned to be brief, so we'll try to do that. Okay. No, it's okay. We have complete trust in the Um I'm not going to do the, the main part of the presentations to you. Others will, but I'm going to do a little bit of a context setting here before we start. Um, the work that we've all been doing for so many years now is really all about partnerships and that's reflected in even the, the banner that you see for the school district all the time about partnerships powering student success. It obviously powers community success as well. Um, and so third party agreements, it sounded awfully dry to me as I was thinking about how to talk with you about this this evening and, and, and that it's really about the partnerships and that's so what you're going to be hearing about tonight are, are two of those major partnerships, one having to do with um, health and wellness and the other having to do with library services. Um, but I also want to put that in context. Um, the main partners here are the 10 of you sitting at this table. I mean the, the city and the school district are the main partners that we are all talking about um, and the joint occupancy agreement that we're working on um, establishes you two as the lead partners of this whole enterprise. Uh, third party, um, as it's referred to here, really has to do with the next tier down. Um, the joint occupancy partners are you two. Um, below that, however, or, or within that, let's say, are some of these other major um, partnerships that you will, that we have been developing and that you will continue to develop. Um, and honestly, they will change over time. Um, you two, the city and the school district, are really the, the, the permanent rocks. You're the, the, the anchor tenants, or however we want to put it. Um, um, and the other, the other third party agreements um, may last for decades, um, but they all, may also change over that period of time. So, so that's the first piece of, of kind of the big picture here. Um, tonight, what I'd like to have you, uh, tonight's agenda is really about uh, being able to bring all 10 of you up to speed on 
where we are in the discussions about those two major partnerships um, with a health clinic entity and with a, a library, potential library entity. Um, I also want you to recall that the joint occupancy agreement, which you're also currently reviewing, um, does describe these third party agreements and specifically um, has a paragraph or two um, on each of these. And, and what that joint occupancy agreement says is that the city and the district will work together on each of these major partnerships, each of these major, major third party um, agreements. And that's, that's definitely the, not only the intent, but, but that's the plan. Um, secondly, um, I want to say that the, uh, that legal structure, the joint occupancy agreement, um, uh, anticipates these third party arrangements um, and it allows for flexibility in them over time. Um, you and you two, the city and the school district, um, you're joined by something that the, the State Board of Education has even approved, um, and you are joint occupant partners. Um, these other entities will be in, in some informal agreements with you, um, but at a, at a bit less of a lesser stature than that relative to the center of community life. Same is true of the facilities design. Um, the facilities design um, can accommodate a lot of different future and even um, perhaps near-term um, third-party agreements. So the, the way that the facility has been designed, the health clinic space can be a school-based health clinic. It can be a community health clinic. It, it may actually have even other um, realities that we have yet to think about. And the same thing with the library. Um, the library can and will function as a school library. Um, it can and probably will function as um, some uh, a aspect of a public library, and, and def defining that is very much um, yet to come. Um, but the facility itself can work um, on a number of different levels and with a number of those different futures. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit further about that and so then finally, the last thing I want to say before introducing the other folks that will talk is that um, for both the health clinic and for the library uh, partnerships, we're at a perfect time at this juncture to have a much deeper relationship um, between the city and the school district in both of these program areas to move forward and, and actually negotiate and form these partnerships. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Juliette Dunn, who's the district's director of, of wellness, I'm going to let her describe um, where we are with the health clinic work. And then following that, um, we'll have a, a, a discussion with the, or you'll have a discussion with the, the folks who have been helping us look at the very beginnings of, of creating um, an operating library that's both uh, for school and for the public. Um, We'll want your input tonight on two fronts. For the health clinic, on how you see the city and the school district um, developing a deeper partnership in that arena and taking that forward with the medical provider partner. Um, we don't have a big um, overarching agreement yet with that partner um, for what services are going to be delivered in the ECCL and how the city and the district are going to be working together to do that. So we'd love your input about that. Um, and then with the, with the uh, library aspect, um, we know that we will need to run an RFP to find a library partner. Um, we're thinking that the, that sort of RFP could run um, perhaps bringing you a draft RFP for your input um, late this calendar year and then actually conducting that process and making a selection um, towards spring of next year. Um, but again, um, uh, I would love your thoughts about actually developing that RFP and, and if you have any um, different thoughts about timeline, that's welcome as well. So Juliet, we'll start um, and then, uh, then we'll talk with the, the library folks as well. 
This is going to be short, um, and if you have any questions afterward, please let me know. Over the past 10 years, Emory USD has developed a credible wellness program. The school-based health center is a place to house those resources. The wellness center will house the following departments, the school-based health center, the family resource center, psychological and social services for Emory USD. But don't let the name fool you. We've always considered Emeryville community in our planning, especially concerning health resources. ECCL is a place where all those plans can be housed. Our initial desire 10 years ago was to fill the need of a lack of any medical or social services for our students and families within the close area. We've expanded the outreach to the community because Emory families are community and citizens. What is good for them is good for our shared community. The opportunity exists to include and enhance an already existing partnership between Emory USD and the city of Emeryville. Currently, the Family Resource Center, as an example, resides at the Emeryville Recreation Department, and we serve schools and community families. We've always worked with the Recreation Department and Senior Services, thank you, Cindy, from beginning to the planning services for all of these needs. We've partnered with Alameda County so, uh, School Health Services, which is part of Alameda County Health Department. They've opened 20 plus school based health centers. Last year, they agreed to work with us and put out an RFP for a medical lead. The two leads that were considered by them were La Clinica de la Raza and Lifelong Medical Services. They chose Lifelong and awarded them the planning grant to help with this facility planning, with funding, and with all the other architectural designs we were working on at the time. They, along, along with our other partners, the California Health um, Centers Association, which actually recommended us going through Alameda County Health Services and Alameda County School Health Services, um, are working with us on planning things to go into the school-based health center. The Wellness Department last year, along with U U UCSF and the Alameda County, no, UCSF and the School-Based Health Centers Association did a needs assessment. We went to the seniors, we went to the families, we went to the students, and we talked about what do you want in the health center? What would be good for you? What are you looking at? What's a priority? And so we have that, that plan and we're using it to give us some ideas on what we should look at in terms of the community. The financial stability of the clinic is based on maximizing the services that they're going to provide, either through insurance payments from grants from the county as well as the federal government. There are many different types of grants once you have a brick and mortar institution that actually work with school-based health centers. And I know that this state, they've been lobbying the California School-Based health, health Centers Association. Too many names, too many different people here. Anyway, are out there lobbying to make sure that we get federal as well as state money for those types of things, all school-based health centers. The opportunity, opportunity exists for us to include a broader community input regarding programs and services. Lifelong is very interested in expanding their outreach to our community. To that broader conversation, we welcome any input and want to further city partnerships. I've worked continually with Melinda Chin, Cindy Montero, and Pat O'Keefe on this product and this project and the, from the inception 10 to 12 years ago. Lifelong has lent us their design expertise to help us with the preliminary architectural plans for the clinic. So far, the space is general enough to function as a school-based clinic and a community clinic. We have not worked out the financial documents, final do operating documents, nor written any MOUs. This is a perfect time for the city to be a part, to be at the table to, to discuss this and to work with us lifelong as well as city services, which we are working with all the time to help us to figure out what else we need to do and what else the community needs. Do you have any questions or thoughts or clarifications? I do have a question. Yeah. Um, so Lifelong's role, you said they got a grant in order to help with the design of the project at mm -hmm. this point. Mm -hmm. And after that is completed, after the project's completed, we don't have any um, extended contract with them, but they are a potential partner for actually providing the services or folding in other organizations. Because I don't know much about that organization. Lifelong Medical has been um, designated by the county as our medical lead. So they basically medical lead is that medical what you said? lead. What do you, okay. you need a you need a medical per, uh, lead agency like Kaiser okay. or they're like Kaiser, they're like um, they're Sutter, they're like, they're like all of those. They're a medical provider and services um, in the Bay Area. And what they do is to help us to set all this up. But they are also medically they will be running the clinic basically. Okay. They're, so that, they're doctors. That's part of dentists the dentists and all the rest. And that was done through the county because the county designates money. Uh, for the school-based health center when you have brick and mortar and they bring those grants to, to four because of the medical lead and through the medical lead. 
So is the grant just covering the design phase, or does the grant extend into the actual the grant services? right now? As soon as we get a brick and mortar, the grant will be expanded. But right now, it's just to covering the design phase. We couldn't get the full grant because we don't have a facility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And do you anticipate though that the grant through Alameda County will cover the costs of having this clinic and like? It will cover the initial costs. The initial costs. We always have to, as any clinic, go out and make sure that we get people who come to the clinic, bring their insurances, look at medical. Medi-Cal, Medicaid, fundraise, get other grants. I mean, this is not something that, that you know, it's like anything else, it, it, but it will cover the basic cost initially. And then Lifelong also will be out there rendering services and looking to find monies and trying to bring things in because they want it to be a success too because they're, your, when, they, when you become Emory Unified School District's clinic's client, you become their client. Jennifer, another another point is that the um, the financial model for running these clinics is that they're Medi-Cal reimbursable clinics. Mm -hmm. So, so the business model is is one that is used with uh, La Clinica de la Raza, uh, Lifelong, and several other um, uh, medical agencies that uh, run clinics uh, in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So, which is one of the reasons we went through. Neutral right. for us. For yeah. us, that's for what I that's yes. what I'm trying to get at. I guess is that um, the as long as they have um, mm -hmm. adequate number of people using their services, that it is revenue neutral That's right, for, have right. for providing the facility. Right. Right. If I could also uh, remind you about the presentation we had from Alameda County Health at mm -hmm. the last meeting where Alameda County Health has stated that it's their intention to use school-based health clinics as a strategy to expand uh, access to health services. Mm -hmm. And I know lifelong Medical is one of the top three providers uh, in terms of community health clinics in Alameda County, uh, along with Asian Health Services and Clinica de la Raza. So um, uh, we have one of the best. Um, uh, I, I should also say they also provide services for our residents at the California Hotel. And uh, I think it would really be terrific at the appropriate time mm -hmm. once uh, the school and the city have worked with uh, um, the health providers to get a list of the services that they think they could provide to have them come and do a presentation on um, what services they're intending um, and because uh, I know that um, their ability to see clients is how they fund their work Most definitely. Yes. Sir. so um, Juliet I, I just want to say first off Thank you, thank you, thank you. You were one of the first hires as we wrapped our minds around uh, a full service community. And um, you started the wellness, all the wellness initiatives from the get go. And um, uh, this has turned into quite a sophisticated operation. So under your, under your guidance and leadership and stewardship. So first of all, I want to th give you big thanks and kudos to you. Um, uh, and I imagine it's been uh, uh, professionally satisfying to see this grow and develop. Um, so with that being said, I, I want to put a couple of um, uh, kind of exploratory things out there. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> First, the funding mechanisms for health services is, is its own uh, study session, and um, which I can actually talk about because of my day job to some extent. Um, but um, uh, I think the kinds of medical services that we need have to include vision and dental. Um, and those, Medi-Cal has, has fluctuated over time about whether they're going to cover those things when um, they cut out dental a few years ago and they're bringing it back to some extent. But if you're dealing with an abscess tooth or something, you know, that, that has significant ramifications health-wise because it's so close to the brain. So those things really need to be, be taken care of. So I think dental and dental and vision are often overlooked in terms of other kinds of medical services. So those are priorities from this council member that we'd be able to provide those um, and the mental health services which have already started um, but but 
uh, need to be enhanced as well. Um, one thing I would ask, and I, I'm sure Lifelong is trying to tap into every revenue reimbursement scheme there is, but the Affordable Care Act um, and California, which has embraced the Affordable Care Act with great gusto, has decided to expand Medi-Cal eligibility uh, to 138% of the federal poverty levels, depending on household size, those numbers change. So um, um, with that, I think there are five plans offered in Alameda County under covered California, mm -hmm. and um, we would need to find out if lifelong, who, which of those plans has contracts with lifelong medical to be able to access payment for them for that. And uh, that should, now that the call center for Cover California is up and running this week, but like I said, it was five million hits the first day on the website, um, uh, we should be able to find out if Lifelong is in any of those plans contracts. As, but we need, to, we need to make sure that whoever gets in there to actually provide the service is a covered entity under any of the Alameda offered um, plans undercover California. So um, there, those plans are here to stay. So we, we need to make sure we, we can line up to, to and have contracted providers under that. It's interesting that you mentioned two things that I was thinking about today. One of the surveys, the survey that we did with UCSF and the School-Based Health Association, the number one desire by most of the people, whether they were seniors, students, or families, was dental care and Lifelong does that. And we have two dental seats that we've already put into the plans for the school-based health center because it's one of the best ways to, to bring in revenue, surprisingly, for a school-based health center. The other part was that I, did, I heard a commercial this morning with um, the chief operating officer for Lifelong and they talked about Covered California and they talked about the number to sign up. So I have this feeling that they are very much in, intimately involved in that process, and we will find out exactly which ones they, they um, are participating in because they recognize and want to reach out to all parts of the community and want to do their best to make sure they're cover. they cover people and, and people can come in and get the services. So, yeah, I'm, I, I know Kaiser's a plan in this county. Mm -hmm. uh, Alameda Alliance is another plan, and maybe lifelong contracts with them. I don't know, but if they contract we'll with more out. than one uh, plan, that would be great. I'll um, find out. Uh, the the other thing is, um, uh, as well as being a contracted entity under a covered <clears throat> California plan, uh, to make sure they're Medicare certified as well as Medi-Cal certified because then we can serve the, um, the disab breath. disabled and senior populations. Most definitely. So, so those, are, those would be necessities from my perspective. And I will be calling you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Barbara Asher. Yeah, I have a quick question. I appreciate what Ruth said about having a study session um, about the- uh, Care finance? Yeah, for the, the um, financing for the school-based health clinic, and that's that's good. I would like to see that. I like I want to better understand the funding mechanism, but I also want to see the budgets of a couple of school-based clinics and see mm -hmm. what they're spending and see what their revenue is, in very concrete terms, so that I can understand um, and have a better idea of it as well. So, if we do have a future study session on that, um, I just want to make sure that that's a, a part of it as well. We can have Case examples. Yeah, sure. yeah, Lifelong runs two clinics, yeah, school-based health clinics, also Alameda County Health Department because they do, uh, the school health department, because they have 20 plus clinics they can bring, we'll have both of those entities at the meeting to explain exactly how they interact, what goes on, how do they do it, and what it looks like in the future and what it looked like in the past. So we'll have both of those people come. Okay. Uh, I have a question that maybe Mr. Bonet might know. Um, our free reduced lunch population is 70 odd percent. Sometimes I see 80 percent. The question is what, do we know what percent is free? Is the qualify for free lunches, it's 130 percent of poverty, which would meet the 
the new expanded Medi-Cal, 135%. Yeah, so, um, I don't know that off the top of my head. Our, our unduplicated count with EL and low income is 74%. Um, the form where I get that information from does have that breakdown, so I can bring that back to the board or city schools. Sure. But I, I, I would think you know, at least 30% or so of our student population probably falls under the free or the Medi-Cal um, oh, limit. I see. Most, yeah. most I importantly, didn't, I didn't understand what you were saying, yeah. but in yeah. terms of, of or for some reason, it's just kind of not going in there. But with Medi-Cal, uh, we have a we have a relationship with reimbursement from Ma, which is Medi-Cal Administrative Assistance, and our our percentage for Medi-Cal they have is about 43.2. Okay, well, there you go. There you go. Perfect. Can you, you besides Ma? Can you use TCM? targeted case management as well? We can. We also have leader services and we're doing Medi-Cal billing, which we're going to try to increase and do some things there with the people that we have on campus. We're learning how to do that. And when you try to add all of those things in at the same time, it makes you a little crazy. So we're trying to do that this year. But MA and uh, itself, they're two different billings, reimbursement right. and billing. The MA reimbursement is going through some changes right now from through the federal government. But as soon as that gets all ironed out, then hopefully we'll be able to add that in too. Okay. Sorry about that. Didn't yeah. get Other questions on the uh, the health school-based health clinic presentation. I just okay. have one quick one, which is how do you, what do you anticipate, or maybe another example from another school-based health clinic in terms of hours? Is this something that is aligned with school hours, or does it extend into the evening? Is it open on Saturdays? I'm just curious, what kind of uh, projection you would expect? Well, we've been meeting, um, Cindy and myself and uh, Roy and the architects and Lifelong, we've been meeting and going through all kinds of different hours. Right at the beginning, we were going to start out with about 20 hours a week and then expand, depending on how many services that we needed. And we would open early for, like the seniors would come in from 7 to 8, we'd have confidential hours for students during the day, and then in the afternoon we would have families and community come in in the afternoon. There's a whole big spreadsheet and chart. So we've been looking at all three of those different things to, do, to make sure that we have a covered time period where we can still maintain the confidentiality for the students, but we can still take care of seniors because God knows students don't want to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, but seniors are happy to come in and do those kinds of things. And then in the <laughs> afternoon, students are in the classroom. So we can take care of students and, you know, people who want to come in. And, into the. So we're thinking about all of those things. Especially and they're all part of the planning process and will continue to be. And hopefully, not hopefully, the, the clinic will be a success and we will expand to, to Saturdays and Sundays depending on fiscal What's the word there? Sustainability. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, Lifelong is very amenable to that, as well as we are. You know, So those are the kinds of things that we're looking at, because it, it doesn't make any sense to not do it if somebody doesn't come. But then we're also doing, net, we're doing working now to get those kinds of programs started so that we can transition them, an already full-fledged product, into. Can I suggest? L Lifelong just started a clinic in Richmond earlier in the year, um, operating 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. uh, can, I, can I suggest to, the, to, yeah. to the extent we're working with mental mm -hmm. health providers such as uh, Ann Martin Center, mm -hmm. um, you might want to include them in some of these discussions because some of the hours when the clinics closed, it might be possible to, to work mm -hmm. with uh, kids and counseling mm -hmm. um, so that we get uh, double use of some of the space. Almost definitely, and the, the Family Resource Center will have, be a part of this building as well as our um, psychological and, and social services, the, the school um, um, social worker and all of those folks will be in, in the area also and in the same building, so that we'll be open a lot more time than just the clinic itself. Okay. So is there a, um articulation of what the cities desires and, and needs are with respect to the, the school based health because that I, I don't I don't have that in my mind. Sounds like you've been having these conversations that seniors coming in and families and uh, vision and dental is, is on the list and I have it would be helpful for the board the school board to know. Okay. One of the things that I will I think we sent it but I'll send it again the the assessment that we did last year 
with UCSF as well as um, the School-Based Health Association. I think it talked to the seniors and several other different families as well as students, and I'll send that in, and it articulates what would be the priorities and what's going on with um, what people want, what they desire, and what they thought was necessary in the area, both okay. mental health, physical health, and, uh, and all the rest. So, so those are the survey results you're talking the about. Those are the survey results. My, my question, which I would love to see. Okay. My question was specifically what, what are our city partners' priorities and desires for the services that they'd like to make sure is available to the community or or should we have that discussion here, or should that be a study session, or how, how should we? Yeah, we haven't had that discussion separate from our city schools meeting. So right. perhaps that would be good to either agendize on the city council so that we mm -hmm. can um, have our own discussion and not use the city schools time to report back. That would be a good thing, because I don't have it. <laughs> okay. okay. Member Brinkman, were you going to? Well, I was going to say if, if the students have these issues and needs I would think the adults would have the same issues and needs so you know I, I would think that they go hand in hand if a child doesn't you know needs glasses most likely somebody in his family needs glasses and, and the same thing with dental care so I would think it's just concurrent with with what we do for the children we do for everybody down especially with the mental health issues because we have we're seeing more and more of that around our city so but it'd be good to look at the demographics of the city which is slightly different than the demographics of our school district um, families and just to understand better you know how many folks are are covered and would be um, well coverage is changing I know yes. but <laughs> how many folks might might actually use these services and if we could get a sense of that it would be very helpful okay I'm gonna um, why don't we see if there's any public comment on the on this aspect of the presentation before we move to the library services any public comment on the health clinic seeing none why don't we move to the uh, the second portion of our third party. so Sabrina can you follow up so we can have our health discussion soon? Yeah. Um, so there was a slide up there that just went off for some reason and uh, I was going to talk to that for just a second. But I, I want to introduce um, KG Oe and Pauline Mingram. Um, they are library operations specialists and have been uh, working with the, the project in terms of advising the design um, and also uh, uh, making some feelers into the, the library partners that are out there and that do uh, provide these services in the East Bay region. Um, if I can get that. I'll get KG and Pauline to, to start speaking with you, but um, I'll try and get that slide back up because one of the main ideas at ECCL is that um, library is really a whole facility idea. It's not just a space within a, a set of facilities. Um, and, and I want KG and Pauline to, as they talk to you a little bit about that, to, to have the image up. We, we tried to highlight all the various spaces and places within ECCL that uh, have library function as part of their program. Okay. Because of your timing, I'll go ahead and uh, I'm KGLA and my partner is Polly Mingram. And um, we are, have been working with the community groups, with some of the staff groups over the last three years. I've actually been I, first as a volunteer maybe five years ago. Uh, commenting before you even had your election, but congratulations on that. Um, school and public libraries as a joint facility are, and joint operations are not an entirely new concept, uh, but there are not a lot of them around, so it's a little bit unique. And if this ECCL is a very exciting opportunity, and I applaud you for the whole concept of the whole campus but also the opportunity to have a school library and a public library. The district has had um, a school library and is very capable of, of running um, a school library for K through 12. But the concept of having joining this uh, and using the facility with the public library is, would be new to Emeryville and it would be, um, again, a, 
an excellent way to maximize the use of the facility. And that's one of, the, I think, the really key things. And you have a shared vision that came out of the community meetings and out of the election itself that said, we, we want to do this. The, as you know, the city already has a contract, and for many years, with the city of Oakland to provide library services that have been principally at the Golden Gate Branch Library, but also gives you access to libraries um, throughout Oakland and actually throughout the whole county. Uh, we visited uh, seven joint school and public library uh, libraries that were in, Oak, uh, two of them are in Oakland, uh, and several are in Sacramento and a couple in Southern California. And based on the size of the population of Emeryville, it is our recommendation that you do look for a partner to run the public library portion of it and work with the district librarian. Uh, and that's because there's really a great advantage to be a, in a uh, partnership with one of your neighboring libraries because it gives you uh, an excess of uh, purchasing power. It also brings you economies of scale on, on a lot of different fields. The real benefit is that you get access to much larger collections and uh, you share the technology, both the back of house technology and also the public uh, technology. And that's really the heart and soul of what uh, uh, modern libraries are about. Uh, the one thing that really works well with this particular concept and, and with the design is that most libraries are always looking for, you know, the one thing we've heard many times, can we have a cafe? We want to, you know, we want to be Starbucks or our pizza or something and we be, have our coffee while we're reading or using library facilities. Well, in this case, there will be, there is a space for a, uh, a cafe. The other thing you're always looking for is meeting rooms because you need little study rooms and you need, uh, or a computer lab, a learning lab. Uh, again, the school has, has, needs that. The library can share that, do some of the instruction in the non-school hours. Um, some of the other areas are the uh, proximity to the teen lounge and the senior lounge. All of those are things that might be in a public library, but in this case are shared in your, in your whole campus. So all of those things are really very different than a lot of the other uh, joint school and public library uh, settings that we've seen and, and really make it a superior project. We've been working with the architects and the school librarian and other members of both the school and city staff to develop a facility and a design, at least a preliminary design of facility that is flexible enough and open enough to operate both as a school library and as a public library. So the, the point where we have had some preliminary meetings, very preliminary, with some of your neighboring uh, larger libraries, Oakland, where you have a contract, or the city has a contract already, with the city of Berkeley, and with Alameda County, and um, and they're, we've talked to them just to find out if they were interested in it. Would they be, would they be want to be a partner? Would, and I will tell you they were a little bit. I'm not going to say reluctant, but it was a kind of a new thought to them. But as we talked a little bit more, they got really excited about what Emeryville was doing. And so all three of them are, are interested and have been in, again, very basic um, early discussions uh, on what this would constitute, what, what kinds of services would be available. So that's the point, that's where we are at now. And as Roy pointed out, we would like to move uh, forward with um, determining a selection process for a partner and work with the staff on um, perhaps a, dr a draft RFP and bring it back to you to make sure that the elements that you are interested in are incorporated into that RFP and then move forward so that um, next year we will be able to put a, um, uh, an RFP together. You can select a partner and that they would be on board in time to uh, do all the prep work that is going to be necessary so that the library can open uh, when, when the campus is complete. So that's the, um, the part we're at now, and any questions you might have, we'd be glad to uh, try to answer them. Yeah, uh, 
he said, he said Berkeley and Oakland. What was the third part? Alameda County. Alameda County. Yes, Alameda County operates about 11 libraries. Um, the one you might be most familiar with is uh, Albany. 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 Yeah. Uh, that's very gratifying that they're interested in this in this concept, and I hope we can move forward with a dialogue. This, uh, you're moving in the right direction. Thank you. <coughs> the, you mentioned that there is one shared library in Oakland. There are actually, um, well, there's one formal one. That's the 81st Avenue Library. Uh -huh. That's actually on a campus with two um, elementary schools. Uh -huh. And um, uh, then the, the second one is the Cesar Chavez Library operated by the city of Oakland. Mm -hmm. It is not formally associated with a, uh, a charter school academy, but it's in the same building. And so they really do operate as a school public library, but it's run by the public library. Okay, so the, the one on 81st, then, I'm assuming it's partnered with OPL, not with the county. It's with Oakland Public Library? Yes, that's okay. correct. It's a branch of the Oakland Public Library. Okay. And I, I have a couple more questions. I'm wondering um, if we can look at those models and understand how many non-school staff it takes yes, in order exactly. to operate that, in order to have some, some sense of, of the, the cost. I understand that this is the first phase of, of doing this project, and I, I do appreciate the detail. Of course, when I look at the spreadsheets, I'm wondering what is the dollar sign, the, the last column that goes, goes here. Um, and so I, I'm looking forward to finding out um, more about that. And um, this, this library, was it, I'd also, I think, like to understand, because our position is a little bit unique. I mean, we're just down the street from another library. And while, um, you know, we may have a, you know, Oakland might be interested in thinking about this uh, new addition as another branch. Uh, we also give them a substantial amount of money every year, and I'm 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 wondering um, what will happen there um, because it, when you look at what you've put together, you can see that a lot of our residents use that branch. It's very important to them. Um, so I'm I'm just wondering if uh, you know if we bring in the county. Um, there's, I don't think there's necessarily going to be a kind of cost shifting from one to the other, but we may be looking at actually paying two entities, um, and that's one of my concerns. Okay. Yeah, I, I do know that um, when in our preliminary discussions with Oakland, we did, they are considering all of those things. I mean, that's part of their interest yeah. is how this may affect the Golden Gate Branch Library and your current contract. But your current contract is really is um, year to year, and so you don't have any uh, um, future obligations if you choose not to. So anyway, that's just the, the, what you have at this point. Right. The other question is this the questions about whether or not Oakland, Emeryville can afford Cost. There's been some rather tough negotiations around what is paid for that library. Um, so I think there's, uh, but I think this is actually an opportunity. So I would, I would encourage us to move to having an RFP t to answer exactly these questions, rather than speculating about what may or may not happen. Uh, if we put an RFP together. To, to ask these questions, to ask, you know, what access, um, you know, what reciprocal use agreements there are in terms of uh, if a library takes operation of this, what other benefits does it bring, what's the staffing. I think uh, Council Member Asher has brought up some very good points which could all be addressed in an RFP and rather than guessing at what it might be, um, if we, let's call the question. And I think there's been enough preliminary. I really appreciate really years of groundwork that has been done on this. Right. Now let's, <clears throat> we've got the foundation built. Let's start on the house. And let's ask what, what's it going to, you know, what is it going to cost us? What are the benefits are for the residents? And then we can assess that 
if we assess that, uh, I believe you, you mentioned spring for a uh, time frame of getting results back from an RFP. If we can get RFP results back in spring, that's plenty of time for whoever we select to have plenty of say into uh, you know, how we furnish and operate. I would also ask that the RFP address the question of are they going to operate the cafe or do we need a separate operator for a cafe or, or is that going to be a school program? So I think there's a, if you could bring back to us a draft RFP, I think we can all try to bake our questions into it and then let's get it answered from people who are actually saying what the cost will be. Right. Um, well, Just for background like information, all three of the libraries, <clears throat> the county, Oakland, and Berkeley, all belong to the same cooperative here in the East Bay. It also includes Contra Costa County. So in terms of reciprocal services, whichever one you're, you're partnered with brings you all of those services wow. shared in a shared way. Now, whether or not they want to duplicate it within a three-block radius is, uh, you know, again, decisions that... The, um, they would need to make. But in terms of the reciprocal services, borrowing from any of those libraries, it's all, all in the same database and um, it makes you, makes Emeryville eligible for being, um, uh, receiving those services. So I'm, I'm going to interrupt this proceeding to, to note that we're coming on our two hour um, Move time to frame. continue uh, the, the agenda. Okay. Second. Two minutes. How long? 15, 20, 30 minutes, or, or until we finish. Until we Bake finish this item. Done. Bake till done. We only have two more. Finish right. this, then we have a five-minute update. That's right. Chair, I'm going to have to leave. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I just uh, 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 any objections to that no. uh, motion? School operations in Oakland. That would be very helpful. If yes, we actually, we, have, we do have those great, already. Great, great. Very good. I, I, have, I have a question about in this report. It's a... Uh, um, Maybe I'm drilling down to too much detail at this point, but um, there was a list of other spaces that in the report that says that um, could be used for library functions, and it includes the, uh, the community plaza and the welcome center. And I guess my question is, you know, I don't get it. That's my question. I don't, I don't get how a plaza could be used for a library function. Well, it's actually a terrific uh, uh, area. Um, a lot of libraries like an outdoor space, and our weather is, you know, pretty good half the year anyway to, to use that. But when you have, oh, somebody just mentioned a posada or a festa or something, you're doing that, it's a lot better to do it outside than inside. Um, there's also other kinds of events. I mean, uh, we've done storytelling both outside. We've done evening story times uh, in pajamas. Uh, anyway, there's there's other kinds of activities that could happen outside of the the walls of the library. Uh, but the computer lab is is one that's uh, very important. Um, tutoring and study areas, for instance, part of the cafe could be used for those kinds of things. Libraries both have to be quiet and noisy. I mean, so you have to be able to separate that out and using some of the other spaces within the ECCL really makes that um, uh, easier, actually, than do, in a confined Do we want space. to include food, a food space, a cafe yeah, with that? Well, the cafe is adjacent to the library. Um, and their tables and so on. Um, we've operated libraries with cafes in them. Both sometimes a friend's operated, sometimes it's a totally different vendor. I mean, we haven't discussed any of those things, but they can uh, coexist with libraries and actually are, are an often requested service of libraries okay. because of Starbucks and Pete's. Well, I mean, along I, those lines, I mean, the. I had the same question in the, the cafe, I understand. I plan to get my book from the library and, and drink coffee in that cafe. I can't wait till it opens and bring my laptop. But the teen center game room, I mean, that, that's a thousand square feet in the estimate that 
how is that part of a library? Right. That's or, also uh, from the li uh, from a librarian's point of view. That's a, that was one of the most exciting things that we heard from the city and the city staff, and that is in some of the libraries we visited, the teens, the pre-teens, the tweens, or whatever they're called. Anyway, that's one of the greatest um, areas of perhaps potential conflict because of the noise and because of, of uh, um, desire to play some games and to be a little bit more active. And so the idea that we've talked about with the city staff is that more of the active um, uh, teen, teen uh, uh, participants can be in the lounge and the more um, academic or studious or tutoring or school-based things can be in the library proper. We've also discussed the idea of purchasing materials that can be placed in the lounge so that, again, you're making use of the space, but you're also uh, using the library's expertise in building collections in multimedia collections yeah. as well as uh, print. <clears throat> um, if I might uh, continue, the, the, I had a question about on page seven, you had a uh, service population, if I'm reading this right, estimated for 2030. And it makes sense to look to the future, but the, the numbers seem to be basically our current numbers, 10,000 citizens and 20% you know, of our current daytime workforce population. So. If I'm reading that right, you know, 15,000 people, that's about where we're at now. Is that how we're likely to grow into the future? Or are we just saying we're, we're not going to be any bigger work in the workday or the resident population? In no, the projections are for 15,000. Mm -hmm. Residents. Right. Yeah. yeah. We're not there yet. Right. I mean, what, we, yeah, right. exactly. Uh, one of the projections so, so that we, project more when, when you're pouring concrete or you're building things that are fixed, it's always hard to project how much space you need for bookshelves and for computers and so on. But one of the things that we have incorporated into that is that with, you have a finite geographical space, but there is probably going to be growth. And so technology, again, helps us in the sense that um, the, the, the equipment for technology is getting smaller. <laughs> and the uh, resources are becoming more prevalent online. So we kind of built in some growth for what you need now, but also what, what we project will happen as more and more things become in e-formats and so on. So that, that's part of it. But we, um, we can use this uh, in that part of the report. We didn't actually write that part, but um, we, we use some of the projections that the city provided us. Maybe somewhat related question, uh, and go, going back to the Golden Gate branch, is it uh, anticipated at all that that we would um, continue that relationship in some respect with the Golden Gate branch, and and you know use have both places, or we'd save money and end the Golden Gate contract and just have our own library? Or is that all part of the RFP discussion I think process? That's a great thing to put in the RFP. I, I, I would like to point out that the City of Oakland's master plan for libraries points out that this area has a deficit of library services even with the Golden Gate Branch. The Golden Gate Branch, they tried to get money to expand it. They weren't able to get it. So they were already looking at Golden Gate not serving the needs of this community. Um, uh, and and we're looking at this community growing in population, so the needs are increasing. And they closed it. They shortened the hours. <clears throat> they didn't shorten the hours. They changed the hours. They they they've shifted the hours and 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 um, but they, you know, there's there's still issues there. Yeah. Um, and and there's been issues yeah, about issues. what mm. how much money they need for Memoryville. I I would I would ask Good that point. if we're going to do an RFP. Um, to see if we could do an RFP for a multi-year agreement, uh, maybe a, you know, like a five-year agreement, so we have some sense of a longer-term relationship. Um, uh, but I think uh, your issue is a very good one, and I, I would not, 
I've, I've valued the Golden Gate Library for years. I wouldn't want that to be um, damaged. Um, but at the same time, I, I want, as, as you've said, um, there's an economy of scale that Emeryville doesn't have. Right. And if we want the best services for our kids, having an alliance with a much larger library with greater resources gives our kids the state-of-the-art resources and gives it to the community in a place where the city of Oakland's um, own plan has said it's underserved anyway. Um, so I, I, think, I think we need to find so a way to Oakland put that into the So Oakland can pay us to serve their residents instead of the other way We can call it a draw. <laughs> Moving along. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, I think Member West is next, but I, I had one more comment, which just that that I have had the ongoing question of how do you combine the collection of for an adult population and the collection for uh, uh, children and teen population, and I appreciate the detail in the report that sort of lays lays that. I don't know if those numbers are are you know right or correct or the best, but I have a more concrete understanding of how you would do that, and I. And I appreciate that. But just to, to your point, I yeah. think, again, in the RFP, we can ask if they have neighboring library services like Oakland, how might they, you know, they, Oakland might have more the Golden Gate be other. more adult and, yeah. and ours be more kids. So I think there's ways to, to make it more complementary. But uh, to the degree you can bring that out in our, or if you ask those questions, um, Member West. Thank you. Um, I just had a, I, I saw in the report what was, would be an ideal square footage or what would be adequate, I suppose, is maybe better. And I just wanted to confirm that the plans, Roy, maybe you could answer this, um, how, what the square footage is for the cafe and the library as it stands right now. Actually, either Mark or KG may know that number off their, the top of their head better than I. Uh, it's in the 5,000. Yeah, the library itself is 4,400. I think it's 5,000, 5,500 square feet, something like that. Okay, so your analysis matched what is in the drawings it wasn't separate from. Right. You made it all fit, in other words, within the architect's um, drawings. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then... My second question is about kind of security of materials. I mean, we, we have the sense of, of checking things out of the library, and when you kind of blow the idea of library out and put it all over ECCL, <laughs> how does that work? You know, a teen center, um, you know, s certain materials you mentioned might be there, and how do you, I'm still stuck in my, like, maybe old 20th century notion of library. So <coughs> I'm trying to understand, again, yes. about materials. Okay. Um, in the library itself proper, there are security gates, so whether you have a barcode or an RFID tag, so it signals it when anybody walks through that gate. Um, we probably have to do something separately from those materials that are in the teen lounge, but they can also be, it, it's like they could be checked out to the lounge, not necessarily to a, a person, and if the person wants to borrow something, they would need to come to, you know, individually and tag it to, to to an individual borrower. So we're really looking at, um, a lot of libraries do that. They put what we call deposit collections in community centers and so on. And um, I'm not gonna say they treat them as ephemeral, but they're not as uh, well secured with these gates and all that, which is an expense, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my last question is, I just learned actually yesterday of, um, I don't know if it's a, a branch, maybe you would know more, of the Alameda County library system, but it's within the Ashland Youth Center in unincorporated Alameda County. I actually met a person who works there, and I, I need to find out more, but um, I'm curious how they kind of have a satellite. I don't think it's a full-on branch, but they have a person and some kind of library services through their youth center, and that might be it. Right. For the county, there's a couple of unincorporated areas. Ashland and Cherryland are two of the ones they've really been focusing on. And now that they've actually are going ahead with the uh, rebuilding of the San Lorenzo Library, it's really gonna help in that area. But those two areas just have been totally underserved. And so they, you know, short of bu building a whole new facility, the, uh, a lot of libraries look for that and, and can put, you know, satellite smaller operations 
in some an existing facility. What's great about em the Emerville plant, of course, is that we'll all be here together. So that's uh, that's again another benefit. But that's what I believe the county is doing. <coughs> they have well, yeah, there's jail libraries too. You know, uh -huh. I, that's another example. So that's a model that I haven't been familiar with, but I think you know this is kind of more enhanced than that, but obviously a little less than opening a full-on Golden Gate branch kind of um, library. So it's good to see the spectrum, and maybe um, if there was further information about a jail library or um, you know one of these satellite um, branches within another center, that would be good information. Thanks for your presentation and thorough response. A quick question. Just you know, I spend a lot of time, uh, well, not a lot of time, but quite a bit of time at the San Leandro Library. Mm -hmm. How comparable would this library in Emeryville be to that library? Well, it's quite a bit smaller. <laughs> a lot, a lot <laughs> smaller. <laughs> I mean, uh, I believe the San Leandro Library is about 50,000 square feet, or 45 to 50. Okay. And this is 4,400. <laughs> And but you're smaller than San Leandro. And San I just want to say, too. San Leandro, what's amazing is how it is a community center yeah, and yes. how it, it um, yeah. the hours, I mean, it's open every evening, I believe, right. and I think all weekends and meetings are held there. Yes. And um, I've, I find it a phenomenal model um, and different from any other libraries that I've been familiar with. And so whatever could be incorporated from that within a certain budget and space, um, you know, um, limitations, yeah. I think that that's the heart I think of the ECCL yeah. idea of having a library, the library. Yeah. right we were encouraged uh, with the superintendents work with the Gates Foundation and this new initiative um, you know the Gates Foundation is a generous donor to public libraries and I've, I've worked personally with them for maybe now 20 years okay. and one of the things that they really that they've recognized is that that libraries are the community at a facility that does the things you've described, meeting room space, cafe space, um, uh, everyone f uh, from infants all the way through seniors. And so, um, again, that's, that's the great opportunity, and that's partly what the Gates Foundation is really interested in, is other models for education. I mean, so education in a broader sense, which is what ECCL is all about. Um, in terms of the cafe, uh, very briefly, my um, children attend a K-8 school where the middle school students have the chance to be young entrepreneurs and run a cafe every morning for the parents who are dropping their kids off. Um, anyone's welcome. But, um, you know, they spent the first month of school getting that together. I think it reopened actually this week. And um, I don't think it's a money maker, but it is a chance for the students to really understand what goes into operating a cafe and, um, you know, on a very small scale. This is for a half an hour in the morning kind of thing, but just thought. You know, Castlemont High School in Oakland had operated the um, coffee shop at the Oakland Airport yes. for many years, and uh, it's one of their, uh, um, one of their success stories. Okay. I remember Simon. Can I ask if it's appropriate to um, have a motion at this time to ask staff to proceed with an RFP uh, uh, draft to come back to us for review. So it's listed as an information item, yeah. and so I think do, I think do we, we need have to put it do on we have consensus a, that that's yeah. the direction we'd like? I just want to make sure direction. that we're all on one page that that we'd like the RFP to proceed to draft so that we can review it. Yeah, I can support that direction, Member Simon. I don't hear anybody objecting. Move along. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. We have, we have direction. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. If there are no more uh, comments from the committee, uh, ask if there's any public comment on this item. All right. Seeing none, uh, we're on to our last uh, inf information. Uh, oh, no. We're on uh, joint occupancy agreement timeline. This one, this one is really quick. Um, this is just a chance to make sure that you and the public know that uh, the joint occupancy agreement is still proceeding forward. Um, the city and district attorneys are um, working on language to iron out the last of the details that we're still discussing, and it's headed toward 
a, uh, you all have had study sessions and joint study sessions and, and chances to, to meet on your own. Um, it's headed toward uh, the uh, city council considering approval on November 5th. And then it's headed toward the school board considering approval on November 13th. So staff is looking forward to those approval discussions. That's the extent of that item. Okay. Thanks, Troy. Any public comment on that item? Seeing none, uh, the last item uh, is task force report. So for this one, um, again, I'm just going to do a quick context setting bit here and then uh, introduce the, the, the presenter. Um, brief recap, the, uh, this idea about creating a t task force to, to look at a full service community and, and a, a master plan of that in terms of, of an array of city and school district facilities that, that support that um, was a major discussion at city schools through most of 2012, actually. Um, the resolution, we looked at various um, iterations of the resolution um, between June and December of 2012. And the task force members were chosen by this committee, or appointed by this committee, um, and then they started meeting in late April of 2013. So um, at the very outset of those meetings, the um, MIG and MK Think, the, the consultants who have been helping to, to run those task force proceedings, um, set out a, a number of meetings and an agenda for those different sessions. Um, they described six sessions and five of those have already been conducted. Um, late this year, the task force will be wrapping up its recommendations for the Annie Yates and rec center sites. Um, the uh, a representative from MIG is here this evening and, and she'll tell you a little bit more about an additional um, session that's been calendared. Um, the school district looks at this uh, process as um, part of its uh, planning for development and, 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 and impacts on its various facilities, um, especially in, in light of the ECCL project, it's really important for the district to understand the, the future uses of its facilities. So uh, as a planning set of documents, um, it's being funded by the Measure J work. Um, and uh, as the task force um, wraps up its work, the uh, city manager and the superintendent will be talking with the city schools co-chairs about how and when to agendize the, the bringing back of that information. But, but city schools will be seeing that information at, at future meetings. Um, so with that as background, um, uh, Diana Sherman is with MIG, um, one of the consultants that's helping to, to accomplish this work. Um, and she'll give you a, a, a little briefing on, on how the task force is doing. Thank you. Um, so we are here tonight. Well, hopefully we'll have a little bit of an illustration here in just a moment of the process. And I think as Roy mentioned, we are most of the way through the process at this point, although I think we are at arguably the most critical part of it. Um, so we were asked in collaboration with MK Think, who is leading this effort, um, to facilitate a process and basically run a set of six task force meetings to really open up the Hopefully you can read that. <laughs> Graphics are the most important piece. Um, to run a process to essentially take a look at what the needs were for a full service community that were not being addressed by the programs either already planned for one of the school sites that is moving forward, so that includes things like this site, um, or that are anticipated to be met by the ECCL when it opens. And so the notion was that there would be these two sites that the uses of which are moving over to ECCL when it opens. So it's the Annie 8 site and the Rec Center site. And they will be vacated, essentially. So what are the appropriate uses moving forward for them? So what we were tasked with doing um, was working with MK Think to really pull together all of the resources that we've looked at across the years um, in terms of the planning for the ECCL, the planning for the general plan, the planning for the park and rec plan, all the different cycles that have, we've gone through of really looking at the needs of the community and also weighing that against the needs of the community moving forward because we do know that Emeryville will be growing 
and look at where the gaps are. And working with a task force, um, a couple of you are task force members here tonight, but we've got council representatives, school board representatives, and a number of community residents. And so working with that group, really honing in on which, which pieces of those needs they felt were most crucial to address on these two campuses that will be available, essentially. And then moving forward, um, MK Think, who is looking at the physical planning aspect of this, is really examining, based on the buildings that are there now and based on what might be done with those sites, using or not using those buildings, how can these sites, the two sites best accommodate what the task force prioritized programmatically? Um, so where we are, you'll see, we've done the first meeting, really setting the establishment of the task force itself. Second, looking at community needs and planning context. Then we brought a number of program possibilities and we worked with the group to really brainstorm what people could think of. Um, we looked at models that people liked in other areas. Um, we looked at what, what were the things that people were either unsure of whether they would be addressed adequately at ECCL or felt there might still be additional needs for or areas that we knew for sure were not going to be addressed at all and asked for some prioritization of those. Um, what of those were really the most critical? And we know that from the preliminary perspective, um, the three areas that were really identified, one of them was green space, open space, park space of some variety. One of them um, was arts, um, with the understanding that there still is a plan floating for the arts center and not knowing if that will come to fruition or yet, fruition yet or not. Um, and then the last one is really looking at the needs for the adult population between the ages of 18 and 55, 60 as they move into the senior center. That there was really not a facility or a set of programs designed explicitly for that, although there are some programs at the ECCL that will peripherally pick up that group after school hours. Um, so those were the programs that they identified as highest priority. What we have proposed doing and has been added to this agenda or to this program essentially is a community open house um, because I think we heard from the task force and I know MIG feels strongly about this as well, but it's really important to make sure that there's a check-in from the task force with the community to make sure. We know that a lot of these needs are things that surfaced in surveys and surfaced in past reports, but are they still accurate? Is the task force direction, the, task, the direction that the community would like to see these sites go in? And that's particularly, I think, important for the Triangle neighborhood because obviously Anna Yates in particular is right at the heart of that neighborhood. And the rec center as well is a contributing piece of that neighborhood as well as part of the San Pablo corridor. So really engaging um, with the community. So we are gonna be holding a community open house on October 19th and you will hopefully be hearing a whole lot more about it. Um, so please do. Do you have a time, a time yes, or place? Yes, 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. to 1, to 10 a.m. to noon mm -hmm. at Annie Yates um, in the multipurpose room. And that will be in an e-newsletter and we have flyers that will be distributed. So Hopefully you will be getting multiple points of contact um, with it. Um, and please do, again, get the word out to others that this is an opportunity to really take a look at what the task force has done to date um, and to see the preliminary recommendations. And I think it's important to be clear that although we're calling this a master plan for a full service community, these are recommendations that are gonna come first to you and then they're gonna go to the school board and to the city council because those are the decision making bodies at the end of the day. So what we're looking for and what the group has been tasked with providing are really their best recommendations based on looking at all the data, looking at what the community has to say about it, um, and looking at the sites themselves in terms of what they might accommodate. And that can obviously change when it gets to the school board or the council, um, and that's the prerogative of those bodies to really take action because those sites are obviously are each owned by the two entities. So, that, any questions? I have a question. I may. Um, was Ralph Hawley site originally included in this? Uh, it was not in what we were tasked with doing because it was already programmed at the time that this process launched in April, I think, um, and it was already programmed with a prenatal, pre-K programming at that you point. I, I just thought there were three sites for some reason when we started this process. Mm -hmm. No, it was originally oh, it was referred to as the six-site master plan initially, but it was always scoped to look at those two sites. And we changed yep. the wording to make sure that was clear that we weren't actually I have actually a, a, a few comments uh, on, the ta on the task force. <coughs> I attended two recent meetings, and I've talked to uh, several members of the task force, and uh, I was a little dismayed to find out from them that they were as confused as I was about the direction of the task force, about the rationale for the task force, and let me exp expand on this. We went out to this community with this grand vision of the ECCL as the ECCL would be the center of the community. 
now, even before we knock down the high school, the plans are to go out to the community on October 19th and talk about different areas for different programmatic areas. What are we doing here? Uh, the ECCL is, is a marvelous, marvelous vision. And we have had so far, I would say, the majority support to move forward for this. But now we got a wild card in here. We're, all, we're starting to have a discussion about other places that we're going to have services or programs. It, this doesn't make sense to me. I, I understand that this was, from my perspective, a kind of a knee-jerk reaction to some criticism of the school board that they had no plans for Annie Yates or no, Ralph Lloyd that, or something like exactly that. That's not exactly true. Well, uh, uh, if I may finish, you can have that me after I'm finished. Uh, I, I could be wrong about that, but I'm concerned that the message that the city school committee is sending out, the council is sending out, and the school board is sending out that, oh no, uh, ECCL is not going to be the center of the community. We're going to have sites all over in a one square mile town. There's something inconsistent about this message. And I want everybody to think carefully about going out on October 19th with a widely publicized meeting that says, these are other areas and we have to decide now or we, we we're going to give recommendations now for how they will be used. It doesn't make sense to me, guys. And that's why I asked to have this put on this agenda. So I'd like to set the context and the input, uh, in terms of the impetus for this task force um, a, a little bit differently. Um, when we lost the idea of using the AC transit yard, when we lost the idea of using buying the PG&E site, when we decided to go with uh, land that we didn't have to acquire, um, we had to work in, within uh, certain space constraints. Then as the money uh, for that project cut out buildings and stories in on the campus, we realized we could not house all of the programs that we would like to deliver on the ECCL campus. So when we looked at what the public entities in town had access to, these were the two sites where we could think about housing programs that could not be housed on ECCL campus because of the space and uh, constraints. So. Um, in keeping with the ECCL vision, not everything can be co that we would like to offer in this town can be offered on that site and a lot of compromises and uh, uh, changes had to happen in terms of the, to accommodate what, what could be built there with the available funding. So um, that combined with a lot of uh, public attachment, quite frankly, not to the portables on San Pablo that the uh, rec center you know, uses because, you know, you can't get that loyal to portables that are depreciating every day. But, but there was a lot of loyalty to a neighborhood-based uh, Anna Gates. And so the question is, is what, what can we offer the community, particularly on that site, where uh, that could meet unmet community needs? So because the um, uh, ECCL site can't handle, can't house everything that we want, we can house projects that can be wraparound services elsewhere in the city. So that was the impetus for, for the task force. It wasn't, and, and um, uh, there was a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of, of um, concern about what would happen on that site and what and all the other sites in the city and it only made sense to think about our one square mile holistically uh, and uh, uh, rather than just trying to we couldn't put all of our eggs in one basket on the ECCL site so that so so that was the background for that well, uh, that you know that's your perception of it Ruth my perception of it is 
<clears throat> that we went out this, to, to this community and we told this community that this was going to be a center for community life. The programs would be concentrated there. And now we, we've come to a point in time where we don't have any, any steel in the ground yet, any building in the ground yet. We don't even have the old high school knocked down. We clearly have to go out for another school bond. And it, to me, it is not the time to go out to the community and say, oh, by the way, we sold you a bill of goods on the ECCL. We really can't do what we said we were going to do there. Uh, there there's something inherently, yeah. the timing on this is not good in terms of the, the school bond if you're coming up. What the yes, message it sends tax, is the parcel tax, yeah. a, parcel a, a parcel tax, a parcel not, tax. We don't need another No, no, the, no. the parcel tax. Yeah. Uh, I well, I, I thought. But do you see the point I'm trying to make here? This is a ma this is a matter of the community. So mm -hmm. far, the majority of the people are supporting us on ECCL. I think to go out to the community now and say, "Oh, by the way, uh, it's really not going to work the way we said. We want to spend some more money or do something different here." I think uh, well, I, I thought Anna Yates. What we were going to try to do with Anna Yates was bring another education provider into that site and see if there was a need. But that need was, was, was not a need that was going to be filled by this city per se. It was going to, we were going to talk to City College of Berkeley and see if they wanted to have some sort of educational outreach at that site. And that was the only, only thing I remember about that site. And then secondly, going back to the rec center site on San Pablo, I thought there were some commitments years ago about using that for parking for the senior center. No. So, no, I don't know if that's it, true, but that's well, what I've been hearing. Well, Karen, if, if I can wait a minute. The other issue with the rec center, that was built with housing money, redevelopment housing money. And I don't know where we are in the process here of, of you know, with the state trying to claw everything back, and we have to have a, a way of yeah. getting rid of property, why this task force is even discussing the, the uh, recreation site uh, for the life of me, I, I don't. So, so let's 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 I, go I back to the beginning. Off. Let's go back to how this started, and let's be clear about what we decided. As because this was a decision of all ten of us. So when we brought this to a, the ten of us originally to authorize the consultant to begin this work, the idea was we we don't have enough room. We cut the the ECCL vision was cut down by one quarter. We also don't intend, it was cut to one quarter of its original size. We also do not intend to, um, to sell that site. And there was many rumors that that could possibly happen. Those are malicious and untrue rumors that have no basis in fact. Um, and we've said for years that we intend to bring in, as Kurt said, educational partners and other partners for programs like the Art Center, which I don't know if it has a home now post redevelopment or not. Um, we've talked about Alameda County having teacher center. We've <coughs> talked about recreation space. We've talked about many different uses for the community uh, for that space. We've talked about it as park space. We've talked about it as you know, space for um, other community activities. Um, as uh, Member Brinkman has said, we've talked about it not in terms of programs that the city has to pay for, but as we've done with the YMCA here, as we've done with other partners to be able to trade space for programs. We're a very small town. We're a very small town and we can't afford lots of big programs that other cities have. But what the school district has is some terrific, well-located facilities where we can trade programs for space. So, but building those partnerships, as we found out with the library, we've been talking with the library folks, we have five years of groundwork going in just to get to the point where we can get a good response to an RFP. So the idea was, let's go to the community, let's have a discussion about what are the kinds of uses, and let's give the school board some direction. 
because it's the school board's property. Let's give the school board some direction as to what types of uses, what types of partnerships we need to be building and to, to take the community's direction as what are the services, what are the partnerships to power both student and community recreation success. So when we brought that to the committee, the committee liked that idea. The committee also asked, this committee asked to include the rec center. Let's get ideas on the rec center too. Quite frankly, I, I agree with you. I like the idea. I'm a big advocate of affordable housing. We could have some family housing <laughs> yeah. there. I'd love to see it. And I don't see it in, in the task force. And I, I'm, you know, I'm a little sad about that. But all of this was to advise us, to advise the school board as to what partnerships we should be building. Because we, we now's a good time to talk, you know, when we have a building started, when we're set, setting that up, anything that we can't fit there, we, we're still doing what we told the community we're doing. We're still building um, a city school partnership that links together all the services for our kids. I think it may also be helpful, um, Nora, one of the things we asked the task force to do at their very first meeting was to brainstorm some guiding principles. And a couple that stuck out to me um, that I think address some of your very concerns are, we did hear loud, and we had a lengthy discussion about this too, whether or not we should duplicate services. And one of the eventual guiding principles was that wherever possible, it should, the pro new program should not be duplicating what's at the ECCL. And there were people on both sides of that who felt that some of the ECCL programs, we might want more of them, and we could do some of them at those other sites. But that was one priority. Um, and as another are some of the pieces that are unique about those sites are, for instance, to the extent to which some areas of the N8 site can provide green space for the Triangle neighborhood. Um, that's not something that physically can be provided at the ECCL simply by virtue of location. Um, and so that is a central part of that neighborhood. Um, and so that's another piece. And one of the things that MK Think found in their analysis is that there are also carrying costs of these properties. So even if all we do is board them up um, when everything moves over to ECCL and leave them there, you're going to be incurring cost to maintain them over that time. Right. And so I think the idea was to begin the planning process and begin the thinking process to really figure out where those gaps were, whether or not these properties can even address them, and if so, how. Begin that in such a way and at such a point that they are not necessarily going to sit vacant but accruing costs for some number of years before those programs and in any new uses can go into play. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me it's it's not an either or. I, I, either we have a center for community life at ECCL or we're diffuse and we don't have a center for community. I mean, ECCL, I, I think by virtue, by virtue of the even the third-party contracts that we talked about tonight, particularly the library, I think, um, will function as a center uh, and attract people in the fields and the, and the teen center and the health clinic. And it will function as a center. Uh, what we're talking about here is what else can we provide for the community? What else can we do in, in, in partnership that are non-duplicative services right. that aren't going to cost us uh, you know, the job training, the, the community college, um, the teacher training, uh, what, what can we do? And I think the last thing we, wanted, we want to make sure we avoid is having the site vacant and unused. Uh, and so to, to, to you know, by August 2015, we need to know what we're doing with that site and have it... Um, um, have the partnerships built and the and the plans in place. And the other piece I think to remember is is that this is part of a comprehensive plan of eventually that is going to present the community as a whole in four of those sites. It's not just the ECCL that are the other sites already. It's already the senior center, the two sites that are serving the zero to five population. So there are already pieces of that full service community that are not being served on the ECCL site physically, but that are just as instrumental a piece of that comprehensive the notion of having a wraparound zero to beyond um, community that is really supporting throughout those ages. Um, those are not all housed on a single site. So. I, well, I, guess I, I understand the dilemma that you have with the Annie property. There, there has to be some forward movement on that. 
but I am concerned about addressing the, the recreation center property. I think we, we should do a research on that uh, to see whether or not we even have the ability to do that under the strictures of the Department of Finance. You know, with our long-term property management, uh, there is response. some there is something here that stri strikes me that we may be, per, you know, going down the wrong road. So before we go out to the public and start talking about the, the NEH thing is is one issue. Mm -hmm. That's it, that's, that's a one issue. Of. But the recreation center, I think we before we move forward to talking to the community about that, we better pull back. Now get some resolution on. I may be uh, uh, not remembering clearly, but I thought at one of the meetings, one of your task force mm -hmm. meetings that I went to, you had some discussion there about the senior center. Mm -hmm. Now, that was not part of the original intent, and I don't believe the city had, had said anything. Yeah, it was not to make any changes to the senior center. Um, the, the two discussions that I can recall that dealt, that touched on the senior center, um, one of them was Cindy actually speaking a bit. Um, there were some questions from task force members about how adequately the needs of seniors were being served by the senior center facility and whether there was a need to provide additional services for that population. Um, and that was, I want to say, at our second or third meeting, third or fourth meeting maybe, when we were looking at program possibilities. Um, and you provided some, Cindy provided some great insight on what types of uses were adequately accommodated on the site and what uses the site was not able to accommodate for that group. The second piece was one task force member who did raise the issue of parking on that, on the rec center site um, in relation to the senior center and whether or not that was an appropriate use of that site. Um, it would be really, I think, helpful to find out if there are any commitments um, from the legal perspective to that use. The task force was not supportive of, of putting a parking lot on San Pablo, so. Well, uh, all I'm suggesting is before you go out to the community, mm -hmm with a broad, you know, a broad invitational to people on October 19th that we take a hard look at that rec center property. We don't make promises. The city doesn't make promises that it can't fulfill. That's a very good point. And I think and, it would be great to follow up with some more information on any on that too. commitments to we that property We want to be careful. Has. We don't over-promise what we can do. ECCL is, is a big deal. Well, Ruth, you know, you say you're, Say you're not promising anything, but in a sense, uh, when you say to people, do you want to park? Everybody wants to park. Of course you want to park. How you pay for it's a different thing. So uh, can we regroup and take a look at this yeah. task force and how and when you go out to the community? And, and, if and I keep hear, in mind the parcel tax. And if I hear Member Davis right, I think she's talking all about perception. She exactly. doesn't want to put a perception out there right. to the community that may or may not happen. And I can understand that. And the fact that we still we promised the community something in ECCL through Measure J, and that hasn't started its fruition yet. And I, you know, if I'm hearing her correctly. Visibly. Visibly, right. That, that's what you hear. That, mm -hmm. that, right. You got it right mm -hmm. on, Miguel. Right. So, you know, I, you know, and, but at, on the same, same token, I hear staff saying that, you know, these recommendations from the task force will be compiled together and they will wait until they publicize them to the public based on all these other factors that we're talking about tonight. So, and, and from the school perspective, the school needs to have a master facility plan. We do not have that. We still have some excess bond capabilities that, you know, in the future we will be able to spend. So from the school board perspective, it is prudent for us to look at all our sites and have a future plan. And I, and I take it that this is what this task force is doing from the district perspective. Can I just add one thing? I've also had people say, why don't you sell the Anagate site and start retiring your debt a little bit earlier? So I mean, I know that's probably something that most people here in this room don't want to hear, but that, that is a thought process that people are applying to that site, so. And, and I have to say, it, it would be 
counter to every conversation we've had on the school board to even I know that Joshua but I'm, I'm just saying that there's so a lot of thoughts the out amount there. of money we could get from selling the site would be peanuts compared to the community benefit we can get from those sites so but I do think the point is well taken about timing and I think when we originally set the time frame for the task force the idea was uh, that we'd be under construction by now and, exactly and perception, things, perception, and things perception. have shifted <laughs> however uh, uh, so I, I would ask if if, um, if the city could send out information about whether or not um, mm -hmm. that site is allowed to be used for the uses that we're talking about or can it if it's if it was bought with housing money maybe it can only be used for housing and the committee needs to know that yeah. exactly if exactly. if that's that the really case we, we then the if that's the case uh, the October 19th meeting really should be put off so that the committee can be informed of that change and and take that into at account at least put it off till after you knock the damn school down well I, I think timing a Jeez. I think timing a community meeting to the time that we're knocking it down is a good good idea um, but um, I, I would like to put that in staff's hands to look at how to align all of that, you know, to, to, to make the adjustments since, since this schedule was originally put together. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It seems like the, the timing doesn't mesh right now. Yeah, right. and we need, we need the portable test. We need it. Okay. Um, can I just add that, I, yeah, I agree with what I've heard here tonight, and I feel that, um, I understand that it takes a long time to set up partnerships, but based on a recommendation and one community group, the school board's not going to be making a decision about what's going to be opening in September of 2015 on that site within the next month or two, no, I, right, I would right. hope. And so you don't want to be premature and give the perception that this is what's going to be there, um, and then things things will change. So I'm I'm curious if there is a timeline for the school board to follow I feel like the city isn't necessarily going to be bound to that same timeline and I want to be clear that we're not necessarily following the same timeline um, and that if you if you need to build a framework for partnerships it behooves us to explore many different partnerships and not just the one that at this point seems most likely it sounds like we need um, because there is time that goes by and, and to see what needs are not being met. Um, you know, the three that were, that rose to the highest priority was green space, arts, and serving the adult population, 18 up to seniors. And um, based on, you know, Ruth's comments earlier saying that ECCL just cannot contain all of the programs that were originally intended, <laughs> I, I see that in some ways. We thought of a bigger site with more green space, um, you know, a performance space perhaps, and if that's what is coming out. But I'm just, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, or I'm not convinced, I guess, that the, the task force has been considering, but since you sit on it, maybe you can uh, confirm the same perspective that, as you uh, expressed this evening. They have all different that's, perspectives on yeah. that task force. And so, force. so I'm, I'm just a little. <laughs> They're a bunch of individuals. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a recommendation, but obviously, and it carries some weight, but it's not going to be the deciding right. factor. And, and it's, it's important, I think, again, to manage perception, I think, as Miguel said, because Maybe. timing is not but ideal. To, to, to answer your question, I mean, I think we're talking about a matter of, you know, a month or so of timing. Um, I, I, I'm concerned that um, from the school standpoint, we have to make it clear that we don't have any unused facilities. That's so I think no, I that is that. that is that is paramount. So I wouldn't want us going, you know, into the first quarter of next year without a facility. You know, we need a facility plan for what we're going to do with our facilities, um, uh, for many many reasons. Um, not the least of which is planning, but there, there's, you know, it's too, too too late this. to get into a long diatribe on what we can do, um, but. But for, but I'm I'm fine with staff going back and you know if we have to shift it a month that to, I would love this this it would be great if this 
open house could also be a celebration and, and a description of what, what are the programs going into ECCL and you know, talking about where we are with the library and where we are with the clinic and where we are with the arts that programs. That would be much better because then you get some balance and if you mm -hmm. have it after you have a clear sight on the high school, uh, the perception is going to be a lot different. And your focus, hopefully, on the task force would now be Anna Yates entirely. That's Correct. right. That's right. No, I, I think that's that's. I, I think it makes a cleaner, cleaner way to go. I very but much. But if we can confirm that. I very much appreciate you bringing this to the. Well, to the meeting. I, I, it was uh, kind of a shocker to me going to those meetings. I'll tell you. So do, does uh, the staff have enough direction? And I'm looking at both. Um, Ryan. It sounds like we're pushing the meeting, um, which is, is good because we were due to send it out to the newsletters. So <laughs> we'll make sure it doesn't go out. Um, pushing it. And the, do you know the date yet for when the demolition of high school is? We'll talk. Not quite. Okay. Yeah. And so when you say meeting, the meeting. The community uh, meeting, but it we're probably talking will about also affect the meetings. task force meeting. Because yeah. the, it does right. not make sense for the task force to right. reconvene until the community right. meeting is happening. And are we going to have a right. grand celebration when they implode the school. Have one hell yeah. Of party. yeah, I mean, a press release and pictures. Yes, yes, yes. You get a, a river rock for, down your, for your garden. Are, are Everyone going to do a fundraiser selling parts, oh, yes. selling rocks, <laughs> a certified <laughs> rock? From okay. Alumni, so Member Brinkman has a, yes, has I, a serious I, question. Betsy Cooley <laughs> ran out of here to go home, and she gathered the information on Measure A parcel tax and it runs through July 1st, 2019, and it's 19 right here. Yeah, no, seven. There, there's some we, issue we, around we, that. Oh. Yeah, we verified we, that. We figured yeah. out it's okay. seven. Okay, yeah. that's we need to talk to Betsy. <laughs> 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 there are there are there's there, wrong information. Oh, yeah. to adjourn. There. Yeah, there 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 were to, to, right. to her point though there were two public documents and um, that came second. out, okay. and the one that is correct has been validated by uh, Lou Edwards. And it is the 17th, okay. 2017. So. so whatever's on the web needs to be corrected. Whatever's yes. out there. Okay, we've had a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Motion and second. Right. And a second. All right. Hearing no objections, we're adjourned.